What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The question I have for you today, young people, is what are you exchanging your soul for today? You have an eternal soul. You're made in the image of God. And God Almighty someday will judge your life in righteousness. Going to judge your thoughts, your words, your deeds. And most of you are just not ready for that day. But judgment day is going to come, friends. And God is going to judge you. And you mockers and scoffers will be mocking that day. I guarantee it. You can laugh and mock now. Get all the laughing you can now, but there'll be no laughing on Judgment Day for sinners. The Bible says there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth on Judgment Day for sinners. They know what's about to come upon them, the eternal judgment of the eternal God. So God has made you to live eternally somewhere. There's no dying here on earth, going to the grave, being eaten by worms, and that's it. If you believe that, you've bought a lie. You're deluding yourself. You're deceiving yourself. The Bible says God has written eternity upon your heart. You know you're going to live forever somewhere. It's just a matter of where. Can I ask you a question real quick? Uh-huh. Um, so I'm a Christian, and I was just wondering, I have to go to class real quick. I was wondering if you why you think this is a good way of evangelism. So this young lady here claims to be a Christian. Potentially sharing your testimony. And, and she asks why I think this is a good way of evangelism. My question for her would be, has she ever read the Bible? The Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The Bible says, how can they believe when they were not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? So... Jesus said, whatever you hear in the ear, preach in the house stuff. What you hear in the darkness, speak in the light. That's what Jesus Christ said. So I'm just simply being an obedient Christian by preaching the gospel. And the Bible says the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to who? To those who are perishing. But it's the power of God and the salvation for those who believe. So if you're a Christian, a professing Christian, I think this is the wrong way of doing it, I shouldn't be doing this way, or it's a foolish way. So sure as on, you don't know the scripture, well, or you don't want to obey the scripture. You're putting some words in my mouth. What I was asking is why you have maybe potentially not shared your testimony. No, no, you asked me a question, lady. The first question you asked me is why I think this is a good way of doing it. Right. My question for you in response to that is why isn't it when God said to do it this way? Are you smarter than God? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you wiser than God? Answer the question later. Are you wiser than God? Okay, so they, we know the It's a rhetorical question, obviously, because we know the answer already. But the fact is, you're not wiser than God. And the wisdom of God is foolishness to those who think they're wise in this world. But this is the way God has chosen to save those who will believe, to preach the gospel to go into the highways, the byways, and hedges and compel them to come in. That's what Jesus Christ commanded, what Jesus Christ did. It's what John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest man born among women, did. He went out to the wilderness. He looked crazy to most people eating wild locusts and honey, or locusts and wild honey, wearing camel's hair for, for his clothing and a leather belt. Had a beard, he had long hair because he was a, had a Nazarite vow, and people thought he was crazy. They went out to see him, and many got baptized in the baptism of repentance. And that's what you need. Excuse me. Um, if I may politely ask, um, are you a, a Catholic or are you a uh, Protestant? I'm neither a Catholic nor a Protestant. Mm -hmm. I'm a Bible believing, Bible obeying, born again Christian. If you're looking to categorize me, young man, I'd more affiliate with the early church fathers. Early church fathers. People like Justin Martyr, people like Papias, people like Irenaeus, people like Polycarp. You read their writings, I believe what they believe. I believe free will. I believe in um, if every sin you've committed is your own fault and no one else's fault. I believe that you should be living a holy life. I believe you can depart from the faith and cease to become a Christian, even though you've become a Christian at some point in time in the past. And not only that, I'm not aligning with them because I'm aligning with them. They believe what the Bible teaches. 
um, which is God's holy word. The Pope, he's an antichrist. He's not scriptural. He's not biblical. He says things like, you know, evolution's okay. If you're not a Christian, you can go to heaven. He covers up child molestation. Shame on him. And I'm, I'm not a prophet. I don't believe people like Martin Luther or John Calvin, who, in my opinion, were complete false teachers. They came out of the Roman Catholic Church, but not enough. Um, I have a question about that um, specifically. Um, so if you don't subscribe to um, Catholicism, or Orthodoxy, or Protestantism, but you claim to be non-denominational, isn't that kind of being protesting against the uh, church um, like tradition and order? Young man, I never said I was non-denominational. That's words you put in my mouth. Listen to me again. Bible-believing, Bible-obeying, born-again Christian. I follow the words of Jesus Christ, the words of Scripture, which is God's Word. And it says about itself, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. Does the Bible so hold on. The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So. I don't need the Protestant Church. I don't need Greek Orthodox. I don't need the Pope and Roman Catholicism. What I need is God's Word. Okay, so and all those places have distorted and twisted God's Word. Okay, so does the Bible say that you can just read the Bible and interpret the Bible any way you want? Just you just you just believe what you want? No, now now you've straw man me. Now you said I interpret it any way I want. Okay, so does the Bible say I need some guru like the Pope, who's obviously a false teacher and obviously a heretic and obviously immoral? Do I need him to interpret the Bible for me? Well, I mean, it, well, I mean, the Catholic Church does have lineage going back to the. No, they don't. You're deluding yourself, young man. You're, you, you, you. I'm, you. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm majoring in history. I'm going to be. Well, then you're engaged in historical revisionism, young man. The Pope does not go back to the beginning. The Peter was not the first Pope. That's nonsense. You've been, you've been sold a lie and you bought it. The Peter was never a Pope. The word Papa, the Latin word for Pope, wasn't around to the fifth century. So then, and the church, the Bishop of Rome was never even looked at it like that until then. And so that's when apostasy started to happen, when Constantine came in and the church became associated with the state and they began to have all kinds of problems then. So you mean, so you mean while Christianity was being persecuted by the Romans and while it was... No, now, now when Constantine came in, he stopped persecution. When there was persecution, it was pure because there was something that kept them on their knees, kept them on their face, didn't put them in control, didn't make them the persecutors, and, but the persecutee. You know, Rome, the Roman Empire wasn't the only place where Christianity was. Say. It was also in India. It was. Also I didn't say it was anywhere. It wasn't anywhere else. When did I say that? No, but you, no, but like, but not, you know, but like, I, I, I thought. That's why when you look and you go east, that's why you have the Greek Orthodox Church, which is closer to the truth than the Roman Catholic Church is. They weren't defiled by the nonsense of Constantine and by church being aligned with state and trying to persecute people who weren't Christians. Where does the Bible say that? That you put the death pagans or make them become Christians because they're pagans. That's what they began to do when the Roman Catholic Church, we know it today, began to come into existence. I don't align myself with that. I love my neighbor, I love my enemy. I pray for them, I bless them. I don't persecute them and kill them. Like the Roman Catholic Church does through all the ages, where it's to the Protestants or the pagans. So why would you, why, my question for you, ma'am, sorry, I asked you some questions now. Yeah. Why are you aligning yourself with a man who calls himself the vicar of Christ on earth? I'm not a Catholic. I never said I was oh, well, Catholic. What are you then, young man? Because you've been defending them all along from what I can tell. Well, I, well I'm, I consider myself agnostic, but I'm very open to... Okay, well, that, okay, well thank you for, for clarifying that. Kind of, kind of uh, clears the air a little bit here. She sounded like you were supporting the Roman Catholic Church for a while there. Well, Were you raised Roman Catholic? No, my parents are Protestant. Your parents are Protestant, okay. So, so you're agnostic, so you don't know if well, God exists or not. My position is this. Like, I don't deny or accept whether there's, a, whether there's a God or not, but if I see it, I'll believe it. If that's just my position on it. Okay, so what do you mean by see it, believe it, young man? If I see, um, you know, because, like, I wasn't alive during the times when Christ was on earth. So I don't know, have any evidence. I don't know whether there's a God or not. Okay, so you basically have set yourself up for failure. You're, you're a histor history student here, right? Right. Why are you studying history? You weren't there. How do you know any of it was true? You're wasting all your time. But there's no evidence that there was a Christ. There was no, no there's plenty of, I mean, have you read the Bible? Then, why, why, is, no, why is the Bible being thrown out, young man? Outside the Bible. Well, why is the Bible being thrown out? Because it's a really, it, 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 Why is it not relevant? Why are your history books here at this college more relevant than a Bible is? It's the most accurate history book there is, young man. 
Well, because it, well, because because of the Protestant Reformation, it's been translated numerous times to fit. Historical revision, young man. That's not true. We have the Greek manuscripts go way back beyond before the Protestant Reformation. I know Greek myself, young man. I know the New Testament Greek, and so I know that the book I have in my hand right now is a reliable and trustworthy translation of the Greek New Testament. Okay, so you're, you're, you've, been, you've been told these things by probably liberal professors. How many books are in that Bible, by the way? How many books are in this Bible? Yeah. Well, if, if you're counting Psalms as five books, it's 70. If you're counting Psalms as one book, it's 66. Is that the Protestant Bible, or is that... Um... This is the Bible that's been the Bible from the beginning, young man. But does that... But, but does All the that books that are in this Bible were accepted from the beginning, have always been a part of the canon, have always been considered God's Word. Roman Catholic Church might have added things later on, but that doesn't mean that makes it true. Well, well, wait, 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 hold on. Let's, let's get back to the foundation. Let's not, let's not get around on a rabbit trail here. All right. Because we're talking about history, and you tell me the Bible is not after history. Now, now because I've, I've dealt with that with you, and you kind of seem hypocritical about it, you want to go off into, well, how many books are in there? Are the right books in there? That kind of stuff. Well, if the Bible is truly the Word of God, why would some people take some books? Okay, so let me ask you a question. If the Bible is true, you don't believe it is, obviously, but let's assume second it is. And the devil is real, and he exists. And this really is God's word. What's the devil going to attack? Uh, what do you mean by that? What's he going to attack? If he's the enemy of God and the enemy of the saints, what's the first thing the devil is going to attack if the Bible is God's word and the source of all objective truth that we have in this world? He's going to attack the Bible. You see, I think That's exactly what he's done, young man. And, and he's got people like you to believe that the Bible is in God's Word because then you won't read it, you won't think it's important, and you definitely won't believe it and obey it. But God's Word's going to judge you, young man, whether you believe it's God's Word or not. But see, here's the thing. The Bible is not a rule book. The Bible... I mean, there's wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you read the Bible? Yeah, I have. How many times? Like, just an average time, like, the, like an average human being has read any other book. No, have you read it all the way through? Not consistently. Okay, so I've read the Bible through like 50 times, okay? You're not going to sit here and tell me it's not a rule book when it says thou shalt not and thou shalt all throughout it. It's a rule book, young man. Where are you getting these cliches from? And the Bible's not who, no, who, no, who, who told you it's not a rule book? It's, it, what, I, I, Have you read Deuteronomy? Have you read Leviticus? It's just full of commands from God to the Israelites of what they shouldn't do and what they should be doing. Okay, so if it's a rule book, then how come the earliest Christians didn't use it as a rule book? Who, who are you talking about? Who didn't use it as a rule book? All these Christians in India, in Israel? No, it's not true, man. Jesus Christ said this. Jesus Christ is the founder of Christianity. He started the new covenant of God. Did he bring a Bible with him? Well, the Bible records what he said. But this is what he said in John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And John 14, 20, says, he who loves me will keep my commandments. My Father will love him. And what commandments are those uh, specifically? Well, all the commandments in the New Testament, remember, all required, all of us here are required and will give an account for keeping the commandments found in the New Testament because it's written upon your heart. God's law is written upon your heart. Your conscience bears witness. It accuses you when you do wrong. It excuses you when you do right. So you know lying is wrong. You know stealing is wrong. You know adultery is wrong. You know fornication is wrong. You know lust is wrong. You know drunkenness is wrong. You know these things are wrong intrinsically. Those things don't necessarily help the human anatomy, per se. You're, you're assuming that right and wrong is based upon human anatomy. It's based upon God's character. God's law is a reflection of his character, young man. And right now, you're not aligned with God's character. Right now, you're aligned with the devil's character because you're a sinner. Well, He who we sins are the devil. What's that? Aren't we all sinners? We all have sin, but we're not all sinners. Christians are called saints in the scripture, not in the Roman Catholic sense. Don't get confused with that. I'm not asking you to put someone around your, your neck on a necklace and pray to them because they're dead. A Christian is a saint in the scripture. A Christian is a disciple. A Christian is a follower. They're a believer in Jesus Christ. And they follow him and obey. Hold on. You're, 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 you're firing off a bunch of questions, but are you hearing what I'm saying, young man? I am hearing what you're are you, saying. Are you, re, are you letting it go into your mind, not in one ear and out the other? I've heard it numerous times from many preachers, and I have, you know... Uh, uh, okay, so Jesus Christ... God in flesh, he commanded things. And if that's true, young man, you're going to have a lot to answer for. And all these excuses you've, you've lumped up for yourself today, these objections you've given me are not going to hold any weight on Judgment Day. God's not going to say, okay, that's a pretty good excuse. My bad. Come on in. It's not going to happen, young man. There's more access to the Bible right now than there ever has been in all of history. All of you within the sound of my voice most likely have a smartphone. 
You can go to Bible Gateway anytime you want and read the Bible. But instead, you plug your ears with wicked music, you plug your ears with wicked podcasts, you plug ears with sports and, and all kinds of things that really just don't matter in the, in the scheme of eternity. But God's Word will matter. God's Word's going to judge you. And you need to open it, you need to read it, you need to believe it, you need to obey it. So you believe everything in the Bible? I believe everything in the Bible. Do you know, okay, um, um, if, I may, okay if I may ask, um, do you, okay, have you read Romans 13? Yeah, I read Romans 13. Do you know what it says? Yes, I do. What, what are you talking about? Well, usually when I encounter people who are, you know, Bible-believing Christians, typically they are not a big pro-government, you know, obeying people. And usually uh, when it's, in Romans 13 says, you know, you, you must obey your government. Uh -huh. You also must pay taxes too. And, uh -huh. usually, and I don't mean if you or any of you guys are necessarily fit this um, um, status, but usually, um, typically conservative usually people usually don't like having big government. Or having okay, government. yeah, so let me just say this, young man, about uh, Christianity and politics. Number one, I'm not political. Number two, I don't vote. Number three, it has nothing to do with me. I am a stranger, I am a pilgrim, I am an alien in this place. I don't give my allegiance to any government. I obey the law of the land as long as it doesn't stop me from obeying my God. But Romans 13 says you have to obey your government even As long as I don't have to disobey God. That's not what it says though. Well, well you see, you're, you're, you know, you're an agnostic, no offense to me, you're trying to interpret the Bible from it, you haven't read it all the way through. No, it is your interpretation. It's exactly what it is. No, it is. Because you, see, you read in the book of Acts, John and Peter were arrested by the government of their land, the religious leaders. And they said, don't preach in Jesus' name anymore. But Jesus says, preach in my name. What should they do, young man? But you're not... No, no, what should they do? Answer the question. What should they do? Well, they did what they had to do. No, what should they do? Should they obey God in flesh or should they obey man? And that's what they said. They said, you judge for yourself whether we should obey man or God. And guess what? They kept obeying God. See, man, man's government is not always going to do what they're supposed to do. We know that obviously through history and even with their own government. But so I'm not aligning myself with government. I'll obey them as far as I'm able to. But if I'm not able to obey them because you're calling me to disobey God, well, guess what? I don't care what they say. I'm going to listen. I'm going to obey God. But I think what it's saying is that you should obey your government the same way that a, that child should obey. You think parents. you think what it's saying. You obey. think what? But here's the problem, young man. You don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have no right to interpret the Word of God at all. No, the carnal mind, the say, things of the Spirit are not understood by the carnal mind. So the Scripture says. So how do you but how do you know your interpretation is any more valid than the interpretations of? of 40,000 different um, other Protestant groups or even the Catholic or the Orthodox. Well, now you're assuming that all these different groups are different than my interpretation of that passage. Because you're reading the Bible and you're using your own private interpretation. No, it's not a private interpretation, young man. You don't understand what a private interpretation means. See, now you're going back to this Roman Catholic. That's why I thought you were Roman Catholic in the first. You're using all these Roman Catholic arguments about interpreting the Bible, but they use their own men to interpret the Bible. So now we're back at square one. The question becomes, young man, did God make the Bible for the, for the godly man, did he, did he make it, did he make it to the way where they could understand it? And my answer is yes. Now, when I was in your place, young man, I didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside me. I wasn't a born again Christian. I didn't understand the Bible. It didn't make any sense to me at all. I was kind of like you. I try to read it. It's like, ah, oh, this doesn't make sense and put it down. But once the author of the script, the ultimate author of scripture is God, the Holy Spirit, because men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write down what they wrote. Once he came and lived inside of me, now I began to understand. My eyes were opened to see what it says and to understand what it says. Now, when I was in college, we had a class on poetry. And our teacher said, here's a poem. All of you go home tonight, read this poem, come back and tell me what it means. How many different interpretations we come back with? 30. 30 students, 30 different interpretations. But if the author of that poem walked into the room that morning, would we know what it says? We know exactly what it's saying. And the author of the scripture ultimately is the Holy Spirit who are moving men of God to write down the Bible. And I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, the author living inside of me, so he illuminates my mind so that I can understand what the scriptures are saying. All the men you're mentioning, especially the Pope and the Roman Catholics, they're all carnal. 
They're wicked. They're ungodly. They will never understand the scripture as long as they stay in their current state. The Pope is not the only Pope. There's also the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. There's also the... Well, I'll tell you this, young man. I don't know enough about the Russian Orthodox Patriarch to, to judge him. Okay? I don't know enough about him. I'm talking about the... Pope Francis is what I'm right. talking about, okay? Right. Now, now, but if I were to sit down with the guy you're talking about from Russia, and we were to sit down and look at the Scripture, and we judge Scripture with Scripture, interpret Scripture with Scripture, I would hope, if he has the Holy Spirit living inside of him, that we can come to the same conclusions. But just because men twist the Word of God, does that mean you can't understand it? How do you know they twist the Word of God? Because it's obvious when you look at other Scriptures in the Word of God. The Word of God compared with itself goes together. And there's no contradictions. You've mentioned um, men like Saint uh, Martin, like Justin Martyr, uh -huh. and a few others. So you know a few of early Christian history, I presume. I know a lot of early church Christian history. So then, by assuming that, then do you know the um, canon laws? Do you know um, like the apostolic traditions? Do you know anything written by the earliest? Um, Are you talking about the Didache? No, no, I'm talking about like what the early church fathers wrote, such as. I've read their writings. Yes, I know what they wrote. And everything I've read from them, I agree with. Okay, so how is that consistent with, okay, so like, usually when I think of like someone who claims to be a traditional uh, Christian, I usually think of someone who's either Catholic or Orthodox. Now, man, you're not gonna categorize me. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not a Protestant. I disagree with Luther. I disagree with Calvin. Disagree with Zwingli. Those guys were false. I'm sorry, but... I'm but and, and then you have the Pope, and I disagree with him, too. I disagree with the Roman Catholic but, Church and their catechism. But you're claiming to be, you know, a follow, claiming to be a follower, you know... Uh, Jesus. Of, of, of the Christian religion. No, 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 yeah. of Jesus. So you're, you're, you're associating these false versions of Christianity with actual Christianity in the Bible. But when I judge them against the Bible, they're wrong. Now, granted, the Protestants are probably more right than the Catholics are, but it's not by much. Not by much, unfortunately. But listen, man, all I all you think that men, 1,500 years after the events of what happened, you know, in his in, in Judea, are more accurate and than what the early church taught them. You're assuming there were nobody between that and the 1,500 years later that actually were following obeying the truth. That's your assumption. So you don't know about these other groups. I would encourage you to. Uh, I would presume it would be the. Um, Roman Catholic Church and the other Orthodox Church. Well, there are some people who are in both those churches who are following the truth, no doubt about it, young man. But, but the fact is, there were other people who were in a part of either. You ever heard of the Anabaptists? Right. Okay. Well, they were following the truth, in my, in my opinion. They started a cult, and they... No, they didn't start a cult, young man. That's, you, you've they been... They the Bible. They had their own private interpretation. They formed a little community. No, it wasn't a private... What, where are you getting this? Why, how are you defining private interpretation? Were there... Okay, okay. Were there Anabaptists in the early church days? People who believed just like they believed were in the early church and they continued until the time of the Anabaptists started. Okay, so why weren't the Anabaptists, you know, you know, like in the early, like, like 2,000 years ago then? They weren't called that then. The there were different names throughout the years, Albigenses, the Waldenses. These people were following just like the Anabaptists were, just like the early church fathers were, they were following the truth of the scripture. Now, you still haven't answered my question. I'm going to ask you one more time. Let's see if you actually answer this time. How are you defining private interpretation? Anyone just picking up a Bible and reading it and thinking, Mine, um, th this makes sense to me. I'm reading it this way. So it makes sense to me. So it must be right. So, so did the Pope do that? Um, I don't think so. Well, how did he get it, how did he get it then? Well, well, I mean. Oh, <laughs> that's what he did. And so you're dishonoring his interpretation, this wicked man. His interpretation above the others. There were popes before the Bible was. And they were wicked too. No, no. The Pope, the Bible's been around since the beginning, young man. No, it has. Were, yes, it has. There was no Pope until the fifth, sixth century. It came out by the church, by the early church. The, the, that Bible you're holding is the church's Bible. By, Which church? The the old the traditional church. What church is that? Um, the Apostolic Church. Okay. So why are you associating them with the Roman Catholic Church? Well, and when I've told you over and over again, I believe like they believe. I mean, here's my thing with the Roman Catholic Church. I, yeah, the Catholic Church has, uh, you know, a lot of problems, and they do, you know, make things up along the way sometimes. Well, let's just brush that under the rug, right? Right, but to me, they seem to be more traditional and valid than just than, than Amazing. Bob, than Bob right here. It, it, tell, it tells me, young man, you obviously don't know the scriptures. I mean, you've already told me you haven't read it through one time. It's not just this. It, it's like, no, no, hold on, hold on. You, you said a lot. I'm, I'm going to respond to it now. So... It's obvious to me you don't know the Bible. 
You are, you've admitted, you, listen, listen, listen. You've admitted you haven't read it through one time and you're gonna sit here and tell me that these wicked men have done all these wicked things against people and they brush under the rug and they cover it up. You're gonna trust their supposed not private interpretation of the scriptures, of but my supposed private interpretation of scriptures according to your erroneous definition of that, that terminology but I don't. For what reason? But I know. But I. But the thing is, I don't know who you are. I don't you don't know. have to know who I am. I'm not asking you to know who I am. I actually get a Bible and read it. But I don't know what makes you your interpretation more valid than the Pope's. It's biblical. So the Bible says. So does the Roman Catholic okay. Church. No, I, okay, tell me, young man, where does the Bible say molest little children in droves and cover it up? Where does the Bible say that? Please answer that question. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's a pretty, you're stumbling over where I think you've been caught a little bit, but please explain to me how molesting little children in droves and covering it up but that's the, but that's just and the paying off people with millions of dollars and saying atheism is okay, Islam is okay. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father but by me. No, no, I'm, I'm still going my question here. Explain to me why their private interpretation is more valid than my supposed private interpretation. interpretation. That's what you're saying. You've been saying it all along. Well, That's know. why I thought you were Catholic in the first place. You have the real heart of the issue, young man. What's your name? Catholic, but, I, but I'm not Catholic. But What's your name, young man? You can call me Steve. That's your name? Yes. Okay, well, Steve, I'm, I'm Kerrigan, Steve. It's right. been good to have a discussion with you, uh, Steve, but here, here's the thing. The real issue here, Steve, is not whether I'm right. The Roman Catholic Church is right. The Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Protestants are right. But it's not just the issue is this, young man. The issue is this. That's... At this point in time, you don't even believe God exists. That's the problem. Well, so I, this, I this, this is really, it. this is irrelevant. See, the whole time, Steve, you've been arguing from a theist position. This whole time. You've been assuming God exists to even argue any of these points you've been arguing. Which tells me I you're... Say, I didn't say God exists. I no, I, I didn't say you said that. You're obviously being inconsistent, no doubt about it, but you've been arguing from a place of God existing the whole time. You've been assuming that with all of your questions. It sounds like that because... No, it is that. That's exactly what it is. It's not about sound. You, every question you've asked is assume God existence. Not one is assuming he doesn't exist. So I'm going to tell you this, Steve. The problem with you is not Roman Catholicism or this or that, these other denominations, if you will. The issue is you don't want God to exist. And you want to make it, you want to muck it up you want to make it look real bad and make it look real ambiguous and vague as if no one can know the truth? Because if you could actually know the truth, and you can, you'd be accountable to it. That's the real issue here. But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church. No, 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 no. We're not going back on that rabbit trail. The issue here is you, Steve. You don't want to obey God. You love your sin, whatever it may be. That's the real issue. The Bible says that people suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Steve. You've got all these excuses you've lumped up in your mind and your heart, no matter what source they're coming from, to bring you to the point where you want to say, well, I can't know if God exists. We can't know the truth. Look, even all these denominations can't agree on anything. So I'm going to come to the conclusion, I can't know the truth. I'm going to be agnostic, and it comforts you. But listen, man, you've got a, you got a conscience that's bothering you because you know all the sinning you've done has been wrong. Actually, there's a reason I'm agnostic, and it's not the reason you think it is. No, I, that is the reason. That's what the Bible says. You're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. I can tell you what it is. Okay, you can tell me what you want. Go ahead. Okay. Um, someone else does something. I was over, I originally planned to become Orthodox, but here's the thing. I have a girlfriend. She's a Seventh-day Adventist. She doesn't want to be Orthodox, and I don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And it was either, you know, like, I either be Orthodox, but I remain, if I get single, or I... I um, be with her, but I can't be Orthodox, and I'm not Orthodox. So it's in. So it's, it's in. It's like I thought it was. You want to fornicate with your girlfriend, <laughs> right? Yeah, you, you want to fornicate with your girlfriend, well, and you, you, you want to fornicate with her so badly that what you thought was going to be truth, becoming Greek Orthodox, you gave that up. Did she give up her Seventh-day Adventism too? No. Okay, so she, she, she must love that more than she loves you then because she's not willing to give up for fornicating with you. Well, I'm, well, I'm okay with her. She wants to be a seven-day Adventist. Okay. That's, that's and she's okay with you being an agnostic? Yes. Well, then, let me, let me tell you this. I don't, I'm not seven-day Adventist, obviously. I disagree with them on lots of things. But she's not a true Christian if she's dating and fornicating with an unbeliever. The Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? <laughs> she, she's in darkness like you are. Of course, she has no problem fornicating with you and being with you at all 
when the Bible says that Christians should never marry, let alone date, let alone fornicate with an unbeliever. Fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. Fornicators will go to hell. And Steve, I'm here to tell you, young man, it's not going to be worth it in the end. I've been a fornicator, man. It's not worth rejecting Jesus Christ in eternal life and going to hell in the end for a little bit of pleasure for a few minutes. It's not worth it. You're going to end up in hell for a girl who doesn't even care about your soul? She won't even tell you the truth that you must become a Christian to be saved? She's not even a Christian herself, and you're giving up your soul for that? Come on, young man. Your soul, your soul should be more precious to you than that. God showed how precious your soul was on the cross by sending His Son to die for you. His only begotten Son died for you on the cross that you might be saved, that you might be delivered and changed and transformed and forgiven. Well, I mean, it was either I, you know, it was either I one day marry her and I have kids with her, or either I don't and I remain single, but I... False dichotomy. The other option, man, is this. You follow Jesus Christ. You trust Him. He gives you... He gives you the wife of your dreams. Which Christ? The, Christ? the Christ of the Bible. We're not going to go down that road of rabbit chugging, man. You know what the Scripture says. You know what's true. You won't believe it. You won't obey it because you're a sinner and you love it. That's all there is to it. Now, if you, if you want the third option, I'll give it to you one more time. The third option is this. This is the option I took. Because when I became a Christian, I was living in fornication before I became a Christian. And the girl I was fornicating with, much like you, claimed to be a Christian. And God said, give her up. No, 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 hold on. God said, give her up. So I gave her up, and you know what? God changed me, God delivered me, and God gave me the wife beyond my imagination, more than I ever could dream or pray for. So you're giving up God's ideal, God's best for this, for, for garbage, compared to his precious pearl. You're forsaking the precious pearl, and you're going to the dump and drinking it in. You're drinking from the sewer instead of drinking the pure uh, water of God's Word. You're giving up the best for the worst. And I'm telling you, man, you're going to have eternal regret if you don't repent. Like, can you be a Christian without the Bible? Can you be a Christian without the Bible? Well, I mean, the early church, the first couple of centuries, didn't have the whole canon we have now. That's what I was trying to get to. So, so the, an the answer is yes, but if, you, if you're asking me this, can I be a Christian without obeying what the Bible says? So, no. Can I be a Christian without obeying the Bible says? The answer is absolutely no. So if they didn't have the Bible back then, what did they have instead of the Bible? They had the apostles. And they had the disciples of the apostles. They had the ones who the Word was, com was coming from, coming out of. Okay, so then where do you think the Bible came from? The apostles. From the Holy Spirit, ultimately, because He inspired them to write down the words they wrote. Yeah, but who wrote? Who wrote it down, though? Okay, let me ask you a question, young man. You, do you, have, you write papers for classes here? Do you have papers you write? Do you, do you have book reports you write? Okay, so who wrote it down? You were the computer. It was the, it was the early church. No, who who wrote down your book reports? You were the computer. I wrote I wrote down my. I wrote okay, but but you used the computer, right? Right. The same way God used holy men of old, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to write down exactly what He wanted them to write down. These weren't ungodly men, they weren't hypocrites, they died for their faith. They proved their testimony, their witness was true, and it was good, and that's the same testimony you have. These men, they wrote these words down with their blood. And you want to say, uh, forget about that, I'll hold on to my fornication instead. Do you believe in the Old Testament as well as the Old with the New Testament, or do you? I believe in the Old Testament, but most of it's not applicable to me because I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israelite. I'm not living in a theocracy. Okay. I'm a Christian, Gentile, living in a new covenant and living in a re American republic. You know, so the, the, the laws they had in the land that were governmental laws, I'm not required to obey those. I'm required to obey the laws of this land that God has put me in, that I'm born in, that he, he knew I'd be born in. And so I'm not, I'm not required to take my son out and stone him to death if he's rebellious against me. I'm not required to take an adulterous woman if I find her and stone her to death. That's what God told the Jews to do for their nation. But when it comes to like f clothing laws, f dietary laws, ceremonial laws, sacrificial laws, I'm not required to obey because I'm not a, I'm not a Jew. I'm not living in a theocracy. I'm not living in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, I'm living in the New Covenant. Okay, but didn't the early church fathers wrote canon laws, um, you know, for followers of Christ to follow? The laws that they appeal to, and I don't know who exactly you're talking about, but the ones I've read, the ones I named earlier, who I look up to, and the faith, they believe what the New Testament said. They believed it. And the Old Testament doesn't contradict it, it's just a different covenant. 
a different testament, a different contract, if you will. And that's all there is to it. So the old contract's gone. The Jews are, are required to do certain things still from the old covenant because they're Jewish people. But as a Gentile, I'm not required. You read Acts 15 on that. They don't because they don't have their temple anymore because of well, that's the Romans. Well, well there, are, there are Messianic Jews who understand that Jesus is the final sacrifice for sins. But you made a good point, young man, about those who are not Messianic Jews. Where, where do they go for forgiveness? How do they get forgiveness now? Their Messiah has come. He was wounded for their transgressions. He was bruised for their iniquity, chastisement for their peace upon him. And by his stripes, they can be healed just like you. You can be healed by the stripes of Christ. He died for your sins. He laid down his life for you on the cross, that you might not get what you deserve, young man, that you might get what you don't deserve, which is grace and mercy and forgiveness and pardon through the blood of Christ shed on the cross of Calvary. But he came first to the Jews. He didn't go to the Gentiles, but eventually he sent his apostles to the Gentiles, Peter, Paul, and we're required to obey the new covenant. So you're not a Jew, obviously, I'm assuming. You don't have any kind of his history in, in Judaism. You're a Gentile, right? Right. Okay, so you're required to obey the New Testament, young man. You're required, and you know it. I, I mean, I'm, really, I'm just here affirming what your conscience already says. That's all I'm doing. Also, I have a question. Yeah. What is faith? What is faith? What is faith to you? Like, what does it mean? Well, I'll tell you what the Scripture says about faith. Hebrews chapter 11. I get my definition of biblical things from the Bible. Now faith is a, Hebrews 11, 1, just in case you want the reference. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There it is. It's a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when I have faith in Christ, I've never seen Jesus Christ, but I have faith in him, and then he changes my life, and there's some substance there. I know before I became a Christian, I was wicked. I was a fornicator, I was a drunkard, I was a potty mouth, a liar, a thief. I was a fighter. I got in fights. I was a very angry person, very impatient person. And Christ delivered me and changed me. And people who knew me before and knew me after, they can tell you the difference. They know I'm a different person, night and day. So that's faith to me. Okay, so by faith, you mean like my, my statement of faith? Is that what you mean by that? So like, like what I believe? Yeah, like you, you said you changed, right? So you originally weren't... Yeah, well, the Bible calls it becoming born again. Mm -hmm. John 3 talks about Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Yeah. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Right. Okay, so when someone becomes born again, this is basically what happens. I forsook my sins. So all the thing I was doing, I knew it was wrong. I said to God, I said, God, I don't want to do that anymore. I know it's wrong. I know it's leading me to hell. I know I deserve hell for it. I know it's... Is against your law, and I want to stop that. And then I do that, and then I put my trust in Christ. I'm crying out to him in prayer for mercy, for mercy. And when you do that, the Bible says, Christ the God will change you. The Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you, who cleanse your heart from all the filthiness, cleanse your conscience, cleanse your mind. And you become like a newborn babe, almost. Where I used to be a child, I was innocent. I didn't do the things I did when I was a sinner. And he made me back to that state, and I became like a new person. The things I used to want to do, I didn't want to do them anymore. The things I used to despise that were good, I began to do them and loved to do them. And that's what it means to be a Christian. So did that become like a large part of your personality or your center of who you are? Yeah, it's, it's my all in all. Jesus is my all in all. He's my best friend. He's my King of Kings, my Lord of Lords. I dare not do anything to disappoint Him. I want to love Him and obey Him the rest of my days. He becomes the center and focus of my whole life. He's not a, he's not a side dish. Not the sweet and low I put in my, my, my sweet tea. He's the whole meal, the whole main core. He's everything to me. I'm, I'm currently reading a book on dynamics of faith, and it really talks about how faith leads to this ultimate concern and this truth about like life and um, our being and so forth, and I'm trying to understand that. And so your answer helps me. Okay. Well, what, what, what's your name, young lady? Elena. Elena. I'm Kerrigan. Good to meet you, Elena. Um, well, you, are you stu you're a student here. What kind of uh, major? Political science and law. Okay. Can I give you something to read? Sure. It'll probably help you. Yeah, it'll help me for my religion class. So. There you go. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for asking those questions, Elena. Have a good day. Yeah, so as I was talking to Steve earlier, a lot of you are probably in the same place where you love your sin. 
You love your sex outside of marriage. You love your drunkenness. You may like your pot smoking or your, is that pot or that cigarette? Okay, that's good. Is it, is it legal here? Is it legal here in, in D.C.? Pot smoking is? Okay. Yeah, well, so that's not good for either young man. I mean, you see the warning on the side of the package, right? Yeah, don't put them on camera. It doesn't want to be, son. You see the warning on the side of the package, though, right? Yeah, so that, that's the same kind of warning I'm here to give you today. You know about it already. It's written in your heart. You have a conscience. Like, you can read the warning label on the side of a cigarette package. We're here to warn you of something you already know about in your heart of hearts. You know the things you're doing are wrong. You know you need to be saved. You know you need to forsake yours. You know it leads to hell and judgment. But God is merciful. God is kind. And God is calling out to you today to repent. He's calling out to you today to give up your sins. He's calling out to you today through me to go and sin no more, as the scriptures say. The Bible says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Few who find it. There'll be few who'll be in the kingdom of God. There'll be many who'll be in hellfire because they love their sins and not willing to give them up for whatever reason. And there's no good reason to stay in your sins. No good reason to reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. The scripture says, do not be deceived. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor covetous, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say to those who were Christians in that church of Corinth, and such were some of you, but you were washed but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the grace of our God. So that's what God wants. He wants to wash you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to sanctify you, set you apart for his work. But as of now, if you're, if you're having sex outside of marriage, you're a fornicator. You're unrighteous. In that state, you're not going to inherit God's kingdom. What you need to become is a former fornicator, like me. A former fornicator. Someone who trusts God, began to live pure, and then God gave me a wife. And now I can have all the sex I want as a married man. You know, you know, God made sex, you know that? God made sex. But he provided boundaries for your good. You know, if everyone would have a monogamous marital relation, they'd wait till they got married to have sex, there'd be no STDs. There'd be no STIs. There'd probably be no abortions. So there'd be no unwanted pregnancies. Solve lots of problems. There'd be no waking up next to someone you didn't know and wondering where, who they've been with and what they just gave you. But fornication is outside of God's realm, his boundaries of sexual activity, this thing that he's created for your good. It's a good thing. It's not, it's not dirty. It's not evil in and of itself. It's the way you do it that is dirty and evil. The pornography you watch, the things you do while you're watching pornography, whether in your mind or with your body, these things God abhors. It disgusts God. And it's outside the boundaries God has created for, for goodness in that realm of life. The Bible goes on to call adulterers, said that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, adultery, most people know, is someone commit, ha, being married and having sex with somebody else. Well, you need to follow Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. He died for you. He was a lamb. Yeah, he did. He's the Lamb of God who can take away your sins, sir. You don't have any sins? You never lied? Now I know you're lying. You're sitting right there. Yeah, as I said earlier, Jews have no sacrifice. They have no forgiveness. They have no pardon because they have no temple. We don't trust God. We do have a temple. It's called a the synagogue's not a temple, young man. Where's the Holy of Holies? 
Where's the Ark of the Covenant? Where's the mercy seat? Where's the high priest? Where's the table of showbread? Where's the lampstand? You don't have any of that. It was destroyed in A.D. 70 as the judgment of God upon your nation because you refused to trust I, in your Messiah. I, may I trust God? Can you trust God? Yeah. Of course you can. All right. Yeah, you need to trust God. Part of trusting God is obeying God. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be in Jesus at all but to trust and obey. Yeah, you got to trust and obey. Not just trusting, not just obeying. You know, if you stop all you're sitting now, you don't trust in Jesus Christ, you still got your past sins to answer for. You're still in trouble with God. If you trust God for forgiveness of your past sins, but keep on sinning, you're still on your way to hell. God commands you to repent. Repent doesn't mean you say sorry and keep on doing it. Repent means you give it up. You go the opposite direction. If you're going north, you go south. If you're going east, you go west. And that's what God wants you to do. And Jesus Christ said, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, friends, I know the hard yoke, the heavy burden of sin that weighs upon your heart, upon your life. As you continue in sin, you lay up for yourself more sin upon yourself, more condemnation, more wrath. You put yourself in greater danger of hardening your heart and never being able to come to a knowledge of the truth and trust in Christ and be saved. That's why today is the day of salvation. If you hear his heart today, do not harden your hearts, but get right with God. Give up your sin. Whatever it is, it's not worth it. But going back to the adultery, Jesus Christ said, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Now tell me, young man, tell me, young woman, how many times you've lusted already today? Tell me. How many times you looked at a woman today and lusted after her? Tell me, woman, how many times you looked at a man today and lusted after him? The Bible calls that adultery of the heart. So God's not just going to call you to give an account of your deeds and your words, but your thought life. How's your thought life doing? How many times in the last week have you lusted? Yeah, a bunch. He's being honest. Now multiply that by 52. How much done this year? Multiply that by 75 if you live to be that old. You've got a lot of crimes against God. You know, if you, if you lust just 10 times a week, it's over 500 lusts in one year. It's a lot. Over 70 years, that's 35,000. 35,000 sins against God. And that's just one sin. I'm not even talking about lying, which most of you do every single day. I'm not talking about covetousness, which most of you do every single day. I'm not talking about drunkenness, which many of you do every weekend, or even more than that. I'm not talking about getting high on weed, which a lot of you do as well. You know, your sins are heaping up for yourself. See it as it is. See it as this huge mountain that you can't deal with. This huge mountain that God's going to call you to get an account of. But the Bible says you have faith as a mustard seed. You can remove that mountain. You put your faith in Christ. That mountain can be removed from your life because Christ will remove it. Christ can change you. He can deliver you. He can free you from all your sin, all your bondage, all your corruption, all your condemnation. Christ has the power to free. Jesus Christ said you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But he also said, I am the truth. So he can set you free. He said, he that commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave will not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. See, in your slavery to sin, you continue to commit sin. In your slavery to sin, Christ can set you free. But you got to repent. You got to lay it down. You got to surrender your sin to Jesus Christ. 
You gotta wave that white flag. You gotta put down your weapons of your warfare, your sin, your free will you're using wrongly right now. And you gotta submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what the scripture says. But the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Don't shake your head, young man. Truth of God's word. I hope you have a good eternity, young man, when you trust in Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. See, so the word is near in my mouth right now. So the word's near in your heart right now. I'm trying to sow the seed of the word of God into your heart. So he's near to you right now because you're hearing the word of God. So seek the Lord. Don't run away from the Lord. He's seeking after you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Because there'll come a point in time where it'll be too late for you. There will come a point in time when Christ will no longer be able to be found by you. Whether it's you dying in your sins or Christ returning and you're in your sins. Call upon him while he is near. Don't call upon your sins. Don't go to your sins. Call upon Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. He's the only name given under heaven by which we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. You know, your sin has done you no good. I've been where you are. You have problems in life. You think going to some sin is going to solve your problems. You think drinking a little beer will drown away your problems. Smoking a little weed will get rid of your problems. Go out and have some sex with somebody will get rid of your problems. It never does. Has it worked yet? Hasn't worked? No, it hasn't. You still have your problems, young man. You still have your sin. That's your biggest problem, your sin. You still have your sin. Yeah, you do. And your sin and your problems are caused by sin. Whether your sin or someone else's sin, it always what causes your problem. And more sin will not solve your problem. More sin will not get rid of your problem. This heaps up more problems for you. That's why you see people who are supposed to be the happiest people in the world, they're miserable. They're killing themselves because their sin has not solved their problems. Questions, please? Yeah. Hellfire and brimstone? Do I believe in that? Of course I do. Jesus preached it. Book of Revelations? I believe it. Enoch? No, I don't believe in the book Enoch. I'm going to see it today. Nicaea, uh, Council of Nicaea in 323? Council of Nicaea means nothing to me, sir. What matters to me is God's word. Bible of Judas? What's that? Bible of Judas? No such thing. Okay. Thanks for your help. Yes. Don't be deceived by the false gospels. Don't be deceived by these extra biblical books that are fakes, that are frauds. The word of God. Sharpen, double-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow. The Bible says there's no creature hidden from God's sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to who he must give an account. You're going to give an account. God sees your sin. He sees your deeds. He sees your thoughts. He knows your words. Jesus Christ said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. It is brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, evil things. But I say unto you, for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. That's the word of Jesus Christ. What words are coming out of your mouth today? How many filthy words have come out of your mouth already today? Zero. Zero? Really? No F word? No. What's good? What's your, what's your background, young man? What do you mean? What's your religious background? Uh, I don't really follow religion. Well, I didn't ask you what you're following now. I asked you what your background is. I don't know really. I don't really follow religion at all. So your parents aren't religious at all? Well, I'm asking if they forced you. I'm asking you what they brought you up in. Brought you up as a believer? So why don't you cuss, young man? Why don't I? Yeah. I don't need to. What's that? I don't need to. 
Don't need to. Okay? But have you lied? Yeah. Have you stolen? No. Have you looked with lust? Yeah. Have you had sex outside of marriage? No. Have you gotten drunk? No. Have you done drugs? No. You've been covetous? Yeah. Okay, so you I mean listen, you can you can cross one sin off the list, but you still got a bunch more to go through. You know, don't don't think you're okay with God because you're not cussing. Don't think you're okay with God because you don't cheat on your tax or you haven't had sex outside of marriage. You still have other sins to account for. Namely, with you, you're an unbeliever. Unbelief's a sin. It's a sin. The Bible says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's what's going to happen to unbelievers. You know, so people ask me, well, what about the atheist who's a good person? No such thing. Unbelief's a sin. Unbelief makes you not good in God's eyes. Good in God's eyes is moral perfection. Not sinning at all. That's how the Bible says no one's righteous, no, not one, because we've all sinned against God. But the question becomes, can you repent of that and start to live the right way? The answer is yes. And that's what God expects of you. He expects you to repent of your sins, to turn away from your sins, to forsake your sins, and go the right way. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's where you're at. You know, forsake your way. Forsake your thoughts. And return to the Lord and he will have mercy on you. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's many of you that have done heinous sins, abominable sins, but the fact is this, where sin abound, grace abounded all the more. Doesn't matter how big your sins are, how great they are, how much they are, the mercy of God is available to cleanse you of all your sins, all your unrighteousness. God is able, God is willing. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to come to him for mercy? Are you willing to humble yourself under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time? That's what he wants for you. How you doing, sir? Good, how are you? Great. Wonderful. Greetings. Thank you. Wonderful. God is good. God is very good. Better than I deserve. Yes. I deserve hell fire. And the Bible says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. So when you come to Christ, you don't lay aside just some filthiness, just some sin, but all sin. And let's go back to our list of sins, which are considered unrighteous, and which if you're doing those, you won't inherit God's kingdom. We left off with adultery. We left off with porn watching and lustfulness. How that makes you an adulterer at heart in God's eyes. How it makes you unrighteous and condemned in God's eyes. The Bible goes on to talk about idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? <laughs> idolatry would include bowing down the wooden statues, things you made with your hands and worshiping them, but it also includes any false god out there. Any false god. So, and very practical... Very blunt terms, it means this. Hinduism is wrong. It's unrighteous. If you're a Hindu, you're currently on your way to hell and you need to repent and follow gay? the one true God. If you're happy? No, I said gay. That's, like, that's what gay means. It means happy. Uh, I meant homosexual. You mean a sodomite. But if you're a sodomite, you're in the same amount of trouble the people of Sodom were in. Right. God rained fire out of heaven, destroyed them. But... But God can straighten you out. All right, it's here now, Matt. I think my girlfriend has permanent damage. Sorry. No, that's not true. The Bible says there's people in Corinth who were former homosexuals, former sodomites. I have a friend in Australia who is a post-op 
homosexual from male to female. He became a Christian, repented, and became a male again. I know what a homosexual is. Someone who's perverted. Someone who's perverted, someone who's condemned. Someone who's doing the exact opposite of what God's called them to do. And God left us the testimony of Sodom and Gomorrah as a testimony to us. What the scripture says about it. Hi. Hey. One thing, brother. Huh? One thing. I wish you good, honest peace. Okay. What's, why, are you a Christian? No. What are you? Jewish. Okay, well, I, I wish you the same thing, sir, and I wish you would trust your Messiah. Thank you. Jesus. He's your Messiah. Peace. Yeshua. Peace. He was wounded for your transgressions. I he was bruised peace. for your iniquities. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace of Jerusalem. Yeah. I pay for the peace of the Jews. Peace. But peace only comes through following your Messiah. Peace. Salvation is found in peace. Jesus, in Yeshua's name. Peace. Joshua. Peace. He loves you. Peace. Brother. He died for you. Peace. He shed his blood for you, sir. Follow your Messiah. Follow Yeshua. He died for you. But the scripture says about Simon and Gomorrah as Simon and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual morality and God after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Simon and Gomorrah's fire did not stop when the city was turned into ashes. Their fire for the people who died in that destruction from God was eternal and has set forth an example to you that you would not walk the same way. Now that you wouldn't become a homosexual yourself, but you wouldn't support that perversion. You wouldn't support that death style that's destroying men and women's bodies and men and women's souls. So homosexuality is an abomination to God. It's shameful, it's vile, it's unnatural. Not what God created you to be. God didn't create male for male and female for female. He created female for male to be a helpmeet. That's what it says in Genesis, the very beginning. And women may not like that, but that's the fact. You get on God's program. So the Bible says, but those who are going back to idolatry before I got sidetracked in sodomy, idolatry is unrighteous. Idolatry is a sin. My Jewish friend who came by a second ago, he's not following the God of the Bible anymore. He's rejected the perfect image of the Father, Jesus. He's rejected God in flesh, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, his King, his Lord. The final sacrifice for sins, the one who prophesied about the temple being destroyed in AD 7 as a judgment upon them for not receiving their Messiah, to open their eyes and receiving him as they should have. But even now, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, offers salvation to the Jewish people. But it's only found in his name. Not found in any other name given under heaven. But Jesus Christ for salvation. But then we have Muslims. Muslims aren't following the, the true God either. Allah is not a God of the Bible. Just because Allah is the Arabic word for God does not mean we have the same God. Islam says Allah has no son. The Bible says he has a son. Islam says Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. The Bible says he did, and through that sacrifice alone can you be saved and forgiven of your sins and cleansed of your sins. And the Quran says that Allah is the greatest deceiver. The Bible says the devil is a father of lies. Combine those two things together, we have a revelation there. The Allah of Islam is the devil of the Bible. It's that simple. And he would try to get you to not follow Jesus Christ, who died for you and just call him a prophet, when he claimed what he claimed about himself. You're being deluded. You're being led astray. Your religion of works is not going to help you. You'll never be able to balance out the scales around your neck. You know, even Muhammad himself said, I do not know what Allah will do with me. 
Listen, the prophet who you say, peace be upon him, you say that about him, he doesn't even know if he's going to have peace or not. For all he knew, he was going to be condemned by Allah. You can't even say, peace be upon him, with any assurance that he couldn't say it about himself. But Jesus Christ offers the peace that passes understanding. And there's no peace with God for the ungodly. If you're ungodly, you have no peace with God. You have none at all. But the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, offers you peace. He offers you a peace treaty. But you've got to surrender. You've got to lay down your weapons. You've got to lay down your sin. You've got to give up your sin and follow Him. That's the only way you'll have peace with God. Until then, you'll remain an enemy of God through your wicked works. You remain an enemy of God through your sin. And you'll end up in hell in the end. Because that's where God sends His enemies. God sends His enemies to His jail cell called the Lake of Fire, called Gehenna in the Greek. That's where He'll send His enemies. Don't let that be you. He's offering you a peace tree today. But when it comes to idolatry, <laughs> Jesus Christ, in one sweeping statement, makes every other religion fall. He said, I am the way. Think about it, English students. I am the way, definite article. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What Jesus Christ said. And by doing that, once again, he said, Hinduism is wrong. Islam is wrong. Judaism is wrong. Roman Catholicism is wrong. Sir, are you saying you support terrorists? I support terrorists? Wait a minute, young man. I'm trying to figure out your logic for a second here. I just said Islam is wrong, and you're asking me if I support terrorists? I just said Islam was wrong, and you're asking me if I support terrorists? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you're saying you hate Jewish people. No, that word never came out of my mouth, sinner. That's a lie. You're saying that Jewish people need to repent? Yeah, they do. Does that mean I hate them? Exactly. I mean, I don't know. Well, it doesn't. You're the, you're the, you're the Bible guy. Well, well, they don't answer your question for you. They may... well, that's why I'm listening. I'm just asking questions. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Me calling someone to repent doesn't mean I hate them. Well, I'm just trying to learn. In fact, if I, said they, if I said they were okay, that would be hatred. If I said they didn't have to repent, that would be hatred because I'd be lying to them. You're just clearing it up. Just then they'd be on their way to hell. I'm on my way. Well, you are on your way, but you don't have to. You can get off that path. No, See, right now you have the narrow path. Yeah. Crossing over the broad path. People on the narrow path are preaching to those on the broad path and telling them, get off the broad path that leads to destruction and get on the narrow path that leads to life. That's what God wants. That's the only path that will lead to life. It's the path of Jesus Christ. Surrendering to Him, submitting to Him, and obeying Him and following Him. So these other religions are false. They're false ways. They can't help you. They provide no mercy, no forgiveness, no cleansing, no transformation is, is provided through these other religions. They're just dead religions. But the living God of the Bible offers you life through Jesus Christ, through repentance. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. So God offers you life. He offers you cleansing and pardon. He offers you times of refreshing from His presence. But as long as you stay a fornicator, a drunkard, a homosexual, a sodomite, you're homosexual? No. Why are you cheering for it then? Gay people are just cool. Well, they're not gay. They're miserable. They're sodomites. It does. That's why, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm correcting you. That's why I'm correcting you. They're not gay. They're homosexuals. Yeah, but I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew. See, I knew what you were going to say. I'm not a Jew. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear what I said. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. Well, let me say it again. I'm not a Jew. Okay. See, so what, what's your background, young lady? What's my background? Yeah, what's your spiritual background? I was raised a Christian, but I don't believe in Okay, so you were raised a Christian, but you were never taught about the New Covenant and the Old Covenant? I probably didn't pay attention. 
Okay, well, that's your problem right now. You're not paying attention to what I'm telling you. The old covenant, no, the old covenant doesn't apply to me. I'm not a Jew. I'm not living in a Jewish theocracy. See, right now, you're not even paying attention. There, that's the real problem is you don't want to hear the truth. But the truth can set you free. Can you please stay here? Prove it ain't true, young man. Huh? I said prove it isn't true. Well, what, what evidence do you have that it's not true? Really? Okay, well, well then, then prove to me evolution is true. Oh! What am I? What's that? I'm not a descendant of an ape from our ape-like ancestor a long time ago. And you have no proof of that either. No, you don't. You have no proof. Absolutely no proof. DNA doesn't prove anything. So, so if you have DNA that's similar, it means you came from that person. No, no, no. We're not talking about. We're talking about ape-like ancestors. So us having similarities to ape creatures today means I have a common ancestor with them. So what you're saying is you having DNA with your father. Oh yeah, that kind of logic, that kind of logic, and that kind of proof is nothing. It's like me going to a junkyard and finding a Volkswagen Beetle and finding a Ford truck and then finding a Cadillac Escalade. Look, they have lots of similarities. They even have the same maker in the back of it. They must evolve from each other. And what proof do you have? No, wait a minute now. We're dealing with evolution. You said science proves it's true. Prove evolution is true. Well, no, so, you don't, so you're admitting you don't have any proof. No, I just gave you proof. No, you didn't. You didn't give me any proof. I just dismantled your proof, your supposed proof. Well, then give me the scientific evidence. No, wait a minute. Do you, do you have proof? I told you. DNA evidence. We have fossil records. Fossil records not prove anything. There's no missing links. There's no in-betweens. What we have in the fossil records is what we have today and what is extinct. See, but how do you know that's not? What's that? What? You say you know this is not true. Once again, this is this, this the leap in logic that you're making, young man. You go from, look, we have some similarities to, oh, they must be a common answer of us and apes. Yes. But that's a leap. You don't, you don't see the leap in logic, young man? But, sir, that's not what I'm saying. We are not just... Let, wait, wait, hold on. Let's go out to the parking lot right now. Let's find a small car. Let's find a big car. Let's find a bigger car. Let's find a fancier car. And let's come to the same conclusion you're coming to and say, you know what? They must have evolved from each other. Are you comparing machines? And that's, and that's, more, that's less complex than us. Are you saying machines are the same as organic life? Now you're making no leap in logic. No, that's just that. That. You compare. Young man, yeah, it's very simple. And yes, it's, it's very simple. You're, the, the thing you're saying is this. Because things are alike, they must have evolved from each other. My, what I'm saying, once again, is this. Follow me, no, follow me, follow me. Because cars are alike, and they come from different ages, it doesn't mean they evolved from each other. No one's saying about machines and life being the same thing. You believe life came from non-life. What proof do you have of that? What example do we have anywhere in history that you have observed or tested or reproduced of life coming from non-life? The Yuri Creek experiment. And, and what, what was involved in that? When they took methane gases to the Earth's early atmosphere. And, and uh, wait, wait, who, who did that? Who did that? Yuri and Crick. That's why it's called the... And, and, and what was he? He was a human, right? Yeah, but he... So, so you have... So wait, hold on, hold on. That is proof of creationism. Because we believe an intelligent being, an intelligent being, put things together and made the world. Are you saying you... That's, that's, that's proof of creation. That's not proof of evolution with no God involved. That's not, that's not proof of life coming from non-life. That's a human being, life. That's life creating an experiment. Sir, what it's saying is that it's possible to create life before you... If you have an intelligent being, they're doing it. It's just like the scientists. Are you saying you need just like the intelligent being being there a scientist? So I believe in an intelligent being, a creator, who put things together, and now we have what we have here today, because he's God Almighty. He spoke things into existence. So you believe life comes from non-life, and you you cite an experiment where life a person no. is putting things together, and you somehow assume with this leap of logic that proves life comes from non-life. So Come on, young man. Use your brain. Are you saying you need a human to have methane, water, electricity in the same spot? Say again? Are you, do you need a human to have methane, water, electricity in the same spot? Where'd the water come from? The earth. Where'd the earth come from? Trump. 
a solar, a solar cloud. Where'd that come from? What? Other stars. Where'd that come from? Hydrogen. So you saw, where'd that come from? You have no beginner. You have no beginning. You have nobody putting these things in place. You have everything coming from nothing. Tell me how that's scientific, please. Tell me how everything coming from nothing is scientific. You know, you know, you know what it's called? It's, you know what it's called? It's called you suppressing the truth and unrighteousness is what it's called. You, you love your sin and you don't want there to be a creator, God. Therefore, you make a way in your illogical mind that doesn't exist, therefore you keep on being a sinner. Tell me, what's, what's the cure for cancer? What's the cure for cancer? I don't have a cure for cancer. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's no leap in logic. No, it doesn't. It had nothing to do with that. In 1940, in, in 1600, how did you cure the flu? Wait a minute now. So what you're saying, what you're saying is this, that because you don't have an answer to my questions, it doesn't mean there isn't an answer. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but, but here's the problem with that. There will never be an answer. You don't know I do know that. How? Because I have the absolute truth of the absolute God on my side. Then what's oh my your God. proof? What's your proof that there's a God? Okay, so what, this young man asked, what's the proof there's a God? Okay, let's start with science, okay? Science engaged in what's observable, reproducible, and testable, right? You test things, you observe, you reproduce the same tests, you make observations, you make decisions on hypothesis and theory. That's what you do in science. Science assumes many things. Science assumes that your five senses are working properly. Yeah, it does. Science assumes, science assumes there's order in the universe. Science assumes there's, or, science assumes there's order in the universe, and you're experimenting to look for that order, that pattern in the universe. So, so the fact is, the fact you even engage in science at all, you're looking for uniformity in nature, you're, you're assuming your sense of working properly, you're using to engage in experimentation and to come to the conclusion you're coming to. No, you. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you using your senses to engage in science? No, we, our senses are flawed. That's why we. No, that, you didn't answer my question. Do you, are you using your senses to engage in science experiments? Try and take our senses okay, so, as much as possible. That's what try to take them out? Yes. How can you see something and experiment and touch it? and believe it with your eyes and hear it with your ears without using your senses. We use measurements and data. Which is involved in using your senses. So every time you experiment, you use your senses, and all your supposed knowledge is based upon these experiments you do, which assumes your senses work properly. What do you which, hold on, which, hold on, which you have not proven. And if you're an evolutionary atheist, don't work. if you're an evolutionary atheist, you have no right to believe they're working properly. No, because they did not, they did not come, hold on, they did not come about if we by the intelligent being creating them. They came about by millions of years, supposedly, of chance random mutations. Now, who's going to believe something like that? Who's going to believe? Well, I know why you believe, because you're a sinner. You love your sin. You say that our senses are unreliable. Why I didn't say that. Sorry, why can't we believe that our senses are reliable? Because you're an atheist, that's why. But why exactly? No, no, explain oh, to me exactly. Well, I just, I just explained to you. Well, step one, atheist. Step two, dot, dot, dot. Step three, prophet. Step four, my senses are reliable. Why do I need to? Syllogism. So how, how, do you, how did your senses come about, young man? How do my senses come about? Yeah. They're an evolved reaction. Light-sensitive cells, sound, vibration-sensitive cells, etc. Okay, so give me some proof of why they're reliable. I don't regulate. They have predictive power. How do you know that? I don't regularly find myself surprised by the world around me. How do you know that? How do I know? I'm you only know that because you're assuming, once again, they're true. You're begging the question, the circular reasoning. That's you're not. saying, I know they're true because I use them. Look, they're working. Yes. But you don't know. You, you have to assume they're true. They're working no, to know they're working. A thing. When I see a thing and I feel it come to me, I'm not surprised by it. I don't regularly expect But how do you know that response is actually accurate? You're assuming that once again. The very foundation of all your reasoning, your supposed science versus religion nonsense, is based upon your senses working properly, which you have not proven, and you cannot prove. And you have no reason to believe they're working properly. I will prove for you that my senses are accurate. Well, there is no proof you can provide for me. That's the fact. Hold on, so there would be nothing I can say that can prove to you that my senses are accurate? Well, I mean, there might be, but I've not heard one yet. Besides the fact that I do not regularly find myself surprised. How do you know that? How do you know that? Circular reasoning. I can state with certainty, I mean, this conversation. How do you know you're stating with certainty? 
How do I know? That yes. Right? You're hearing with your ear? Yes. You're speaking with your mouth? Yes. With your senses? Yes. How do you know they're working properly? Because I'm getting ideas. Begging the question. Tangentially you're, related. To you're whatever. begging the question all throughout. Everything you're saying is begging the question. So there's no begging the question, you see. We're no, that's begging the question, man. So your problem is not science. Your problem is philosophy. You don't have a love of wisdom. We're you exchanging have, ideas. We have to be. How do you know that? How do you know that? You don't know your senses are right. How do you know that? No, I do. I knew they are right. I do know they're right. And I have reason to believe they're right. Well, I have reason to, The reason I have to believe that my senses are working properly because they're created by an intelligent being. That is a proper foundation oh, okay. Let me for believing. Hold on, hold on. Proper foundation for believing. Well, I have reason to trust my senses are working properly because that intelligent being gave them to me. He created them. Hold on. Listen to the answer. I'll let you respond. Listen to the answer. He gave me. Now, if I'm... My sentence came about by chance, random mutation for millions of years. I have no reason to trust them any more than I would trust a, a watch that was put together by nothing over millions of years to tell me the right time. Let alone my eyes to tell me that that's green and this is cement and this is my hand and that you have a blue shirt on. I have no reason to believe that. Well, but I, I, special about blue. I didn't say there was. I'm just pointing out that I have no reason to trust that if I believe what you believe. So the, the sure proof that God exists is this, the impossibility of the contrary. If God doesn't exist, you can't know anything for sure. And that's where you're at right now. You don't know anything for sure because you're trusting your senses, which you don't know are reliable and trustworthy. So you don't know anything for any kind of certainty. I'll trust my senses far before I trust that book. What's that? Be sure that I'm speaking right now. Can I be sure that I'm speaking right now at this moment? Now as an atheist, you can't, no. Why do you say that? I've already given you all the answers, young man. No, but I disagree. I'm an atheist, and I'm sure I'm speaking right now. Well, you can disagree all you want, but one thing you'd have to come to the conclusion on if you're going to be honest with yourself is that you're being inconsistent. But, okay. Nonsense. Yes. I'm no, you know, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because you're responding to it. How does you know that? How does you know that? I'm term speaking. I can, feel my, I can feel my throat vibrating. I can hear the sound. That's all, that's all senses. That's what these things mean, right? Like, so once again, once again, okay, the short, once again, here's the fact. Fine, he assumes his senses are working in order to prove they're supposedly working and that's where he gets all his knowledge from. Now if you want to trust that as a source of knowledge, good luck to you. But I'm going to tell you this, the source, the true source of knowledge is the absolute God of all the universe, the God of the Bible, the God of the scriptures, who commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross that you might be saved, delivered, and changed. He died for you, you might be transformed. He said, if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. How do you know you're God's threat God? Yeah, who's God? God is it? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This young man is asked, how do I know my God is the correct God? Let, let, hold on, hold on. Let me point out one inconsistency in his question. Now he's assuming God exists. No, I'm not. Yeah, he is. That question, that question assumes, how do I know my God is the right God? Assumes that God exists. If he's an atheist, he'd say, well, how do you know God exists? That's what he would say. But now, now he's been converted now to a theist. Praise the Lord. We, we, we're, coming, we're coming down the road. The next step, young man, is coming to a knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ died for you. He's God in the flesh. He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. And if you're not ready, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So, once again, assumes that theism. Answer the question. Yeah, well, well have, you, have you read this book? I'm not thinking right now. Have you read this book? Have you read this book? Yes. The whole book? Yes. How many times? I grew up as a Christian. Five times. My grandmother has a master degree in Catholicism. Oh, well, that doesn't really help you very much. No offense. <laughs> The Catholics are not going to help you. I mean, they, they don't exactly exalt the Bible, young man. They exalt the Pope over the Bible. No, they don't. No, they don't. They, they have the Darby translation, which is really completely irrelevant. But yeah, but young man, to get to your question, I, you know, you can do it. If you are actually a theist, you could do a study. I'm, I'm, I'm answering this question. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. I'm answering this question. Don't be rude. I'm answering this question. I'll get to you in a minute. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Be patient. Be patient. So, yeah, you can do an internal critique of both books where you step into the worldview of Christianity, step into the worldview of Islam, and you see if it's a consistent worldview. And I submit to you, the only consistent worldview out there is biblical Christianity. Uh, no, not really. Right. No. Wait, 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 talks about wait, wait. witches all the time. Hey, What's that? Sir, sir, talks about witches. What talks about witches? 
The Bible does. No, uh, a little bit, yeah. In the Old Testament. Yeah. What does that mean? Sir. Are, witches, are they real? You see well, witches running around? Well, what, what were witches in the Bible? All right, are you are you are you applying like Harry Potter stuff to the Bible? Is that what you're doing? The Bible is applying Harry Potter stuff to the real life. No, see, it, it's it's it's. <laughs> well, of course you believe that. You're a sinner. Of course you believe that. But listen, if witches in the Bible were just simply demonic people who called upon demons to give them information. We have an example for, uh, for example, of Saul, King Saul. He was in rebellion to God. God would not speak to him any longer because he was in rebellion. He didn't repent. And so because he couldn't hear from God, he went to a witch who brought up Samuel from the dead and Samuel rebuked him. So yes, there's, there's, there's people out there who are demonic, but as far as like women riding around on, with a pointy hat on brooms, of course not. The Bible doesn't talk about that. You're applying modern day definition of witch to the Bible from the Old Testament. Not gonna work. Not gonna work. Now, I'm gonna get to him now, okay? I've done a lot of time with you. What's your question, man? What capacity do you have to judge? Are you not familiar as a Christian with John 8, 7? Okay, so his question is, what purpose? I'm still talking. What capacity do you have? Matthew 7 through 5 says that those without sin cannot have, are not able to sin. You, sir, are a sinner yourself. You are a Christian. We are all sinners according to God, according to the Bible. We have no capacity to judge those around us, but to spread our message of love. Peter, Peter says to love one another. Peter says to love one another. Judge. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you judging me? Are you judging me? Sir, I'm not judging. You're, you're not judging me? This young man is a classic case of a log in the eye. He's judging me and telling me I can't judge. He's judging me and telling me I can't judge. You are not leading by example as Jesus. No, I am. Jesus went around and spread a message of love. Show me that in the Bible, young man. Show me that in the Bible. Show me, show me in the Bible. Hold on, hold on. Show me in the Bible where Jesus preached about love. Show me in the Bible where Jesus preached about love. Show me in the Bible, once again, because you said Jesus preached a message of love. Show me in the Bible. Get your Bible with you? I do have a Bible. Okay, well, use your smartphone, use Google, use whatever capacity you have, okay? Bring up to me the message of Jesus' love in the Bible. I got to see this. The commandment of all according to Jesus is to love one another. No, 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 that's not a great, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. The, great, no, the greatest command is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second great command is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, regarding judging, this young man tells me I have no right to judge. Yet in the process, he's judging me. That's called, yeah, you said I was wrong. You said I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Am, am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? I have a, are you a human? Am I wrong? Are you he won't even say it. He's telling me I'm wrong, but he's so scared to say I'm wrong because he's afraid. Oh no, I'll judge him then. I'll judge him. Listen, young people, when you when you get your next grade on your test from your professor, don't tell him, don't judge me. I should have got an A. I should have got a B. Don't judge me. Next time you get a ticket for speeding. And you go before a judge, don't go before a judge, don't judge me, don't judge me. You know, God has a day called Judgment Day, and it's going to come for you. It's going to come for you, and the Bible says that we ought to judge with righteous judgment. It's going to come for you for telling us how to live our lives, too. I shouldn't tell you how to live your life? My life's point. Well, then what is God's word for? I'm a preacher of the Bible. The Bible tells you how to live your life. You reject it because you love your sin. That's the problem. You haven't lived your life right yet. I'm here to tell you how to live. I'm here to tell you if you're not living according to the Bible, you're living wrong. Point blank. You're living wrong because God says so. All right, listen. I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling you what God says. You can not like it all you want. You can take it out of me, call me just men. I don't really care. I've heard it all. The fact is, God is going to judge you. I'm here today to pronounce to you God's judgment before it happens. So I don't want you to be unprepared. I don't want you to be surprised. I don't want you to have this test that comes upon you all of a sudden and you're not ready. And if you're living in sin, you are not ready. 
If you're having sex outside of marriage, you're getting drunk, you're fornicating, looking at pornography, you're not ready. If you're a homosexual, a sodomite, you're a Muslim, you're Hindu, you're not ready. Jesus Christ. Ready for what? For Judgment Day. Jesus Christ is going to judge you according to righteousness. And you're not righteous. You've sinned against God greatly. But Christ can make you righteous. You can be forgiven of your sins. If you'll humble yourself and repent of your sins. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. That times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. That's what he offers you. Times of refreshing. Pardon. Conversion. Now I want to talk about love and hate for a second. Because this generation does not understand love. The generation does not understand hate. This generation is hate if you disagree with somebody. Hate is well. If you tell them they're wrong about anything, that's hatred. Nonsense. That's not hatred. Grow a backbone. People can tell you you're wrong about something. You don't have to go crying to mommy and daddy about it and say you're hateful. You're, that's hate speech. You're, you're judgmental. Listen, if you're wrong about something and someone loves you, they're going to tell you you're wrong if they love you. And listen, if someone loves you, if someone truly loves you, they will tell you the truth no matter what you think about them. And they'll, they'll, they'll want the greatest good for you. And the greatest good for everybody here within the sound of my voice is that you forsake your sins and follow Jesus Christ. That's the greatest good for you. And so I'm here to proclaim that to you. I'm here to proclaim to you, that don't, don't continue in your sins. Don't go to hell. Don't go to what you deserve for your sins. Don't, don't get hellfire for your sins. What's that? I'm going to hell. You can't tell me what to do. I am telling you what to do. I'm telling you not, go, not to go to hell. I'm not going to go. Why do you want to go there? Well, there will be some former liars in heaven. In fact, I tell you this, most people in heaven are going to be former liars because they repented of their lying. But listen, if, if, if heaven being full of liars means you don't want to go there, well, who's going to be in hell? Liars, just like you. You're a liar too. All sinners will be in hell. Except for those who choose to stop their sitting. Those who forsake their sitting and follow Jesus Christ and get the mercy they don't deserve, the, the cleansing and forgiveness they don't deserve, the eternal life they don't deserve. That's what Jesus Christ offers all of you here today. It doesn't matter how great your sin has been, how depraved your sin has been, how much your sin is. Christ is able. He's willing to forgive you. He's willing to cleanse you of all your sin. I know you probably committed some heinous sins, but Christ is willing and able to forgive you. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Oh, don't forsake Christ. Don't push him aside. Don't be apathetic towards him. Don't hold on to your very frail, your very fragile objections, which will be nothing on Judgment Day. There will be nothing on Judgment Day to you. You won't be able to say to God, oh, you didn't give me enough proof for your existence on Judgment Day. He knows better. You're not going to fool him. That's why I'm here today to declare unto you. It's like I became a Christian over 20 years ago. Christ can change you. You can become born again of the Holy Spirit. You can get mercy from God. Well, I am leading by example, young man. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Are you a sinner? I, I'm a former sinner. No. Yes. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Listen, I hear what you're saying. You're, you're not. You're not. You're not telling me anything new. I'm not hearing anything new from you. Okay. Okay. So let's let's. You're a liar. Plain and simple. No, Jesus never said that. Actually. Are you claiming your own righteousness instead of Christ's righteousness? Okay, so that young man is asked five questions. Number one, 1 John 1, 8 was not the words of Jesus Christ. He didn't say that thing. Okay, number one. It's less authoritative. No, I didn't say that. Number two, I'm just correcting what you said. Number two, just because I'm living holy does not mean I don't need Jesus. Are you oh, listen to the question. Listen to the answer. Christ young man, no. listen to the answers. Do you have patience? Is love patient? Then listen to the answers. You claim to be a Christian, I'm assuming, right? Yes. Calvinist? No. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're on the same pathway as them. Oh, 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 I'm answering the questions, okay? So, someone saying you're living holy and they're obeying God doesn't mean they don't need God. So that's, I don't know how you follow that reasoning. The Bible says I can do all things. Finish it for me. So, I'm doing it through Christ. So, I need Christ to be holy. 
Are you okay. Oh, no, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm, I'm perfect in Christ. All my pasts are forgiven. I'm living a holy life. Oh, hold on, hold on. You, you, you keep cutting me off. I'm going to move on to someone else. You keep on doing it. Okay? So, all the things I know I should be doing, I'm doing. Everything I know I shouldn't be doing, I'm not doing. So you are perfect right now. In Christ. In Christ. So you don't commit sins. Well, I'll, I'll say it again, young man. This is very simple. Okay, let, let's, let's, no, it's not a yes or no. Well, uh, we'll have a little English lesson here for a second. Number one, I've sinned in the past. Number two, I could sin in the future. Number three, I'm not sinning right now. So if you sin in the future, does that mean you are no longer in Christ? Well, the Bible says he who sins of the devil. And if you abide in Christ, you will not sin. That's 1 John 3. Nation, do you believe that? So, did you, do you agree with that, those verses? 1 John 3? He who sins of the devil. If you abide in Christ, you will not sin. Do you agree with those verses? I do, but I also... Okay, so, so, so then you answer the question then. You answer the question then. So, if, if you don't persevere to the end, you die in your sins, are you going to heaven? I trust in Christ's righteousness. I you, didn't, you didn't answer the question. What? If you die in your... If you go back to your sins, let's say tonight you go out and get drunk, okay? I, hold on, hold on. I'm not, I'm not done the question. Go out tonight and get drunk. You go fornicate with some girl. You have a, a brain aneurysm in the middle of that fornication. Have you persevered to the end? Have I persevered to the end? Yes. No, you don't. Yes, you don't. Can't lose salvation. Yeah, yeah, sir, I'm talking to him, not you. Have you persevered to the end? I can see him answer. So have you endured? Well, let him answer for himself. Have you endured to the end? You're talking about someone who seems like they have not put their trust in Christ. If you're asking, well, wait a minute now. No, no, hold on. You just said a second ago that you always have to be a sinner. I did not say that. So, can I be without sin? Not, not perfectly. That's why you so, I have to always have sin then? No, you hate Christ. No, oh, man, you're not making any sense. Okay? If, if I'm in Christ, I'm not sinning. If I'm sinning, love the Father or the devil. If I don't persevere to the end, I die in my sins, the Bible says you will not be saved. He that endures, in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, he that endures to the end shall be saved. So, don't tell me going back to your sin is enduring to the end. In 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said this, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end for them is worse than from the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it and turned from the holy commandment delivered to them. That's an example of someone who is in the truth, they're washed, they were cleansed, they turned back to their sins, and their latter end was worse than the beginning. I'm just curious, one more question, then I'll stop. Okay. When Paul says, those things that I know are right, I do not do. Romans 7. And those things that I, that I do not do. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm well, uh, yeah, Romans 7. I know what you're talking about, you man. He has sinned, and he has died while writing that sentence, but he has gone to Romans, that's not talking about his present life. That is talking No, it's not. No, I'll read it to you. In Romans chapter 7. Starting in verse 9. Why are you starting at 9? Why don't you start at 1? Well, I can start in verse 1 if you want to, but you're talking about verse 14 through 25. I'm starting before that to provide context. That's a long passage to read. Okay? So let me start in verse 5, actually. For when we were in the flesh, New King James Version, by the way. For when we were in the flesh, verse 5, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should walk, serve in a newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. So hold on. He's not serving in the oldness of letter anymore, but the newness of the spirit. Now, if someone's walking in the spirit, are they in sin? Okay, so we go, you go on from there. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to read it yourself. And man, I have a video on YouTube. Romans 7, about Calvinism and its influences upon that. I would encourage you to watch that. It's about an hour and a half long, and I go into much depth about this, okay? But Romans 7 is not the Apostle Paul saying, I have to be a sinner, I'm always sinning. That would contradict everything else he said in, in his writings. He was completely against sin. He called people to repentance. Uh, everybody, the Sex and Pursuit Alliance is tabling at 2 p.m. It's basically the Atheist Club. We have the Johnson Center. I have to change so I can, you know, sit down at the table. I got one. Thanks for your interaction, young man. No problem. Thanks for your interaction. Yeah. So Romans 7 is not Paul saying, I'm a sinner and I'm a saint at the same time. There's no such thing as a sinful saint or a saintly sinner. You're either a sinner or you're a saint. Not a Roman Catholic saint, by the way. Just a, a Christian, someone living a holy life. And 1 John 2, 
three through four, and one, two, three, four, the basis of Christianity now. First John two, three through four says this, now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. First, first John is a rebuke, a rebuke to sinful Christianity. It's a rebuke to those who would seek to say, I can be a Christian and live in sin every single day. You need to be holy, young man. You have victory over sin. You obey God, and you can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the, the help of Jesus Christ. I mean, you agree with that, right? Okay. So that's, not perfectly. I have to know nothing not about. Perfectly. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Does God command you to live perfectly? Yes, he does. That is the okay, so, okay so, so God commands it, but, but you're, saying, you're saying it's impossible to do what God commands. I am saying that God demands perfect. Let him answer for himself, okay? You can get to you next. God is holy perfect. He cannot demand anything less than perfection. But he does not demand our perfection. He demands Christ's perfection. No, it's not what the Bible says. We have faith in Christ. We are married to him as Christ is with the church. And we have his righteousness as our own. No. If that holy God with my righteousness, I would go to hell. You are right. You are right. I do not stand in my righteousness. Young man, no one's talking. You're making false dichotomies all over the place. First of all, first of all, the Bible never talks about transferring of righteousness and sin. No, where? It talks where? about Christ's righteousness becoming our righteousness. That's what I'm talking about. The Bible never says that. It does. It does not. You've been fooled by theology you've been listening to on YouTube or whatever else. It does not say that in the Bible, young man. Nowhere does it say that Christ's righteousness becomes our own. The Bible says in, in Philippians, it says that the rights of God in Christ. But it's not about Christ's righteousness. It's talking about us being forgiven of our sins. And the Bible says in Revelation 19, that the fine linen, clean and bright, that the saints were therein to marry Jesus Christ. You know what it says? It's the righteous acts of the saints. So tell me, young man. Let me just read it to you. So I, I can tell you don't believe me already. Revelation 19. I'll read to you what it says. You, just, you mentioned the marriage of Christ. Let's see what it says. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. You claim that's Christians, right? I agree with that. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in linen, fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of Jesus, the righteous acts of the saints. So I'm referring to 2 Corinthians 5.21. God who him had, had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I just quoted that. I just quoted that. I just said the rights of God in Christ. That's what I said. You said the saints were justified by their own righteousness. No, no, that's not what I said. I just quoted you from the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? I'm sorry. Do you believe the Bible? I'm very sorry. I think we're misunderstanding each other. Okay, so let me explain to you one more time, okay? Because we're, we're dealing with theological terms that you have, no offense to me, you have the wrong definitions for them, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you from studying the Bible for 21 years. Okay, you, young man, you're a young man. I can tell you have a zeal. I appreciate that. I really do. And you want to stand up for the truth, but listen, man, you got to dig in the word for yourself. Put aside all these glasses you have on, all these theologians you're listening to, all these books you're reading. Open the Bible and just see what it says, man, without your preconceived notions. If you really want to know what God says, do that, please. I beg of you to do that. But Revelation 19, 7, once again, I'll just read to you once again, okay? And you can come to your conclusions you want, but there's no way in my mind I can come to your conclusion with this verse, okay? Revelation 19, 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, so what I hear from you is this either or thing, this false dichotomy. It's either Christ's righteousness that saves us and is transferred to us, or it's our rights that saves us. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. Here's the answer. Christ's righteousness, which he lived out for himself, not for us. He lived it out for himself. He had to be holy. He had to be the blameless, sinless, spotless Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. So he died for us on the cross as the spotless Lamb of God because that's what was required of him. Now, we don't get his righteousness. That doesn't get transferred to us. But it's through his sacrifice on the cross that we can be cleansed of our sins whether past sins or sins right now that we need to repent of or sins in the future we may commit that we need to repent of. It's only by his shed blood we can be forgiven and cleansed of those sins. 
But God also expects to live out a righteous life. That doesn't save me. It doesn't save me that I live a righteous life. But if I don't live a righteous life, James says, it's proof I have a dead faith. Do you understand? So it's not, not either or, it's both and. It requires Christ's righteousness. It requires me to live holy. Because James said, faith without works. Hold on, young man. Talk, hold on, I'm talking to him. Faith without works is dead. So you say you have faith? I have faith with works, proving my faith is alive. That's all I'm saying, young man. So I'm, you're required to live holy and so am I. And if we're in sin, known sin, unrepented of sin, we're in trouble. We're in danger. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Hebrews 3.12. So watch yourself. Now, who, who had a question over here? Young lady, yes. I know you've been waiting for a while. I appreciate it. I just want to deal with him thoroughly, okay? So what's your question? Can, can, we, can we just do one question at a time, please? You ask the question, I answer it. Then I can ask the question, you can answer it. That's how, that's how, dialogue, that's how dialogue works. Yeah, talk to me? Yeah, I'm looking right at you. Yeah, so you just ask one question at a time if you don't mind. All right, look, I'm a Christian. I'm not a practicing Christian, but I went to All Saints Middle School. I went to Bishop O'Connell High School. And what you're saying is not what they taught me at all. Okay, well. What do you consider myself? What do you, what do you consider homosexual, a sinner? Okay, well, you asked several questions. Number one, it doesn't matter how you were raised, young lady. What it matters is what the Bible says. Okay, number one. I was raised Roman Catholic. I came out of that. It was wrong. I believe the Bible. Okay? Number two, there's no such thing as a non practicing Christian. A Christian who doesn't practice Christianity is a hypocrite, and they're just a bad state of someone who's not a Christian at all. Maybe I'm just confused. What's that? Maybe I'm just well, that's possible, but the point is you're still not a Christian, okay? Because a Christian has to have some knowledge and they have to be able to submit their life to Jesus Christ and be following him and obeying him, yeah, at, at the least. That means you have to have every little you know, nook and cranny understood about the Bible and about doctrine, but you have to understand the basics, okay, to become a Christian. And number three, I believe the Bible says about homosexuality and sodomy. You, I mean, you may not, from what you're saying, it sounds like you don't, but the Bible says it's sin. It's like lying's a sin and stealing's a sin. And adultery to sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, New Testament, verse 9 and 10. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Then it gives a list of sins. It says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, in our interpretation class, it says that a man should not sleep with a boy. That's an empty uh, pedophile. No, actually not. The Greek word there is not. I, mean, I know how liberal theologians try to twist that. I understand that. I know about their teachings. But from Old Testament, from beginning to end, Genesis Revelation is the same t teaching. It's, it's outside. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm talking to her right now. I'll get to you next. It's outside of the realm of God's protection and sexual activity. God created sex. I have no problem with sex, but, but there's outside of God's boundaries. And that's outside of God's boundaries. And those who go outside of God's boundaries, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, they're going to be in trouble with God. It's a sin. It's unrighteous. I'm telling them to be born again of the Holy Spirit, okay? I have a friend in, in Australia. I'm going to give you a testimony, okay? A friend in Australia. He was born a man. He had surgery to become a woman. Lit as a woman for 10 years, I believe. If I remember right. He became born again of the Holy Spirit. He's living as a man now. As a eunuch. He has no, you know. Well, I actually went to Australia recently. I did lots of interviews with him. He's, I've been friends with him for a very long time. And I'm going to put the documentary eventually up on YouTube. I don't have it up there yet. All right, sir. What's your name? What's your association here with GMU? I have no association with GMU. I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, here to serve here. Jesus Christ and preach the gospel. It's a servant of God. That's all. So, sir, you said you're a servant of God. However, God teaches love, and so does Jesus. So that's your first contradiction. We just talked about love a second ago. You Were you here? All of these people on that line, how are we supposed to teach other people to love? Okay, well, you must not have been here earlier, young lady, but I talked about love and hatred earlier. <laughs> love is not accepting everybody the way they are. Hate is not disagreeing with somebody, okay? If you disagree with me, I'm not going to tell you you're hateful. You tell, me, you tell me that I'm wrong for being a biblical Christian by believing what this says. That means according to your definition of hate, you're being hateful towards me. You're telling me, hold on, you're not accepting me for the way I am as a biblical Christian. That means you're not being loving according to your definition of love. But the fact is, well, I, I define love the way God defines love. Okay, well, love is wanting the greatest good. Okay? So the greatest good for everybody here, the greatest good for everybody here is that they follow. their life the way that they're supposed to live. 
living. Absolutely like, not. Absolutely. So well, created, I agree with that. Right? I agree that last part. But God created me in His image, so what I'm doing, God knows what I'm doing. So what I'm no, doing. no, hold on, man. You're, you're making leaps of logic here, okay? When it comes to, hold on. If you listen, do you want the answer? Do you want the answer? Yes. Okay, then then be quiet and listen. Then be quiet and listen. Be quiet. It's not a yes or no question. Be quiet and listen. The Bible makes it clear that loving someone is wanting the greatest good, and the greatest good for every single person here. It's for you to stop being a sinner and for you to follow Jesus Christ. Homosexuality is a sin. Lying is a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Sex outside of marriage is a sin. The Bible never said Jesus got drunk. If Jesus got drunk, if Jesus got drunk, you have no way to be saved. If Jesus got drunk, you're in your sins. Because Jesus Christ had to be perfect to be the final sacrifice for sins. So if Jesus got drunk, like you said, you're hopeless. We're all hopeless if Jesus got drunk. We're all hopeless if Jesus sinned. But the only hope we have is in the perfect, sinless Messiah. You're back then, huh? Jesus Christ. What's your question, man? Well, it's, listen, listen. Just be patient. There's lots of people saying things at one time. Well, I was answering her question. I was answering her question because she asked him. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give her an answer to her question. Now, what's your question, man? Young man, young man. You are walking away? What's what's your question? I saw religious change my mind. If Jesus created me in His image. Yep. And is what I'm doing not what, what not His will? What He wanted? Get Absolutely not. Free will. Okay, so okay, so that's good. Good question. Good question. Say, young man, what's your name, man? What's that? Kofi. Kofi. Okay, Kofi. I'm Kerrigan. Okay, so Kofi asked a good question. He said, "I'm made in the image of God. God's given me free will. So aren't I, aren't I doing what God wants me to do? No." See, if you're if you're sitting, hold on, hold on, Kofi. Do you want the answer? Do you want the answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wait a second, okay? You can get your responding you want to, okay? Being made in the image of God does not mean whatever you do is God's will, okay? Being made in the image of God does not mean you have to do what God wants you to do. Having free will proves you have the ability to do whatever you want to do, but you don't have a choice to choose your influences, okay? And every one of us has free will. And yet God has a plan. And every one of us, every one of us is influenced in both directions. You're influenced to be worldly and be sinful. Correct. Through the world around you, through sinful friends, through the flesh, through demonic forces, you're being influenced to do evil. There's also the good influence, your conscience, the Holy Spirit. I'll get you next, young man. The Word of God. Preachers are a good influence to you to do what is right. Now you get to choose with your free will which influence you submit to. And if you're living in sin, you're currently submitting to the wrong influences. And I'm, hold on, I got a people to go to, okay? But if you submit to God, you can submit to the right influences and be right with God. Okay? Young man, what's your question? So, I see your sign that says general sin. Yep. What, what is, to you, what is that? Well, anyone who's breaking the New Testament laws. So, so you're, so not, you're only going by the New Testament? So I'll let him ask his question first, and I can get back to you if you want to. Let's be patient with you. Let's, let's let people take their turns. Okay, we can be mature about that. So my question to you is: So the Old Testament has a lot of has a lot has a lot of rules that most Christians don't subscribe to. Okay, so you heard my answer though, right? I just got here. Okay, but no, you just asked me a question about general sin. I said I I'm required to obey the New Testament laws. Right. Okay, so let, let me give you the Christian theology of Old Testament laws. Okay. I, I know what Old Testament Testament is. I've been studying the Bible for 21 years, okay? So Old Covenant is what Jewish people are required to obey. It's given to the Jewish people. So in the Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers, you have different categories of laws. You have ceremonial laws. You have sacrificial laws. You have dietary laws. You have clothing laws. You have grooming laws. These are all laws. These are all laws. You have governmental laws, all given to the Jewish nation. Okay? Now when Christ came... Through his own blood, he started the new covenant. Okay? And in the book of Acts, we have this situation come to the forefront in the early church of whether non-Jews, whether Gentiles were required to obey the Old Testament laws. In Acts 15, the question was proposed, well, do Gentiles need to get circumcised, Old Testament covenant, and keep the law of Moses? They said, no, it's not required of them. So New Testament laws... You know, before the Old Testament laws, before Moses, there were still laws. 
we didn't have them written down. I mean, Jesus, when, when, when Cain killed Abel, was there a thou shalt not murder yet? No, but he knew it was wrong. At the flood of Noah, when God said every intent of the thought of their heart was only evil continually, did they have the Ten Commandments? No, but God still judged them and condemned the world with water. And so there's a law that transcends. And there was a law that was given to just the Israelites to separate them from the nations around them. I'm not an Israelite. I'm not a Jew. I'm not in the Jewish theocracy. I obeyed the laws that were before that. And since then, reconfirmed in the New Covenant, New Testament of the Bible. So... So you mentioned, you mentioned Cain and Abel, you mentioned the governing law, of right law, and morals for the tree of wisdom. Yep. For blessed Abel. So as, a, so as a New Testament Christian, do you subscribe to the right and the wrong? Do you subscribe to the mother and the mother God judge? Or how do you fall? Well, young man, that's kind of a false dichotomy, but you, you, you associated loving your neighbor without ju with, with not judging your neighbor. But the Bible never does that, okay? Um, when the Bible talks about judging, it's against certain kinds of judging. Okay, I'll give you that. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 7, 1 is commonly quoted. John 8, 7 is talking about the same thing. It's talking about hypocritical judgment. It talks about you having a log in your eye, trying to take a speck out of someone else's eye, okay? That's hypocritical judgment. Listen, if I got, when I last night got drunk, I came here today and said, don't be a drunkard. I'm a hypocrite. Okay, and that's what God's against. But the Bible says God's also against judging according to appearance. So I saw a young man walking by today. If I saw him wearing a pink or purple shirt and said, well, you must be a homosexual. That'd be judging according to appearance. Another example of bad judgment according to God. But God is not against righteous judgment according to the Word of God. See, I'm a preacher of God's Word. So I've got to tell you what it says. And that includes the bad news. And so I prescribe to loving my neighbor, as you said. I prescribe to judging my neighbor where I need to for their good. I subscribe to loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I subscribe to all the laws because loving God and loving your neighbor is the fulfillment of all those laws. If I'm loving God and my neighbor, I'm going to do all those laws too. Does that make sense? So, given, given George Mason as a, as a many diverse, many ways as a as a as a Christian, I see you, you proclaimed yourself. What would you have us take away from this to change how we live our life, either for God or what? What do you want us to take away? Okay. From well, today? good question. What's your name, by the way? Dylan. Dylan. I'm Kerrigan. Good to meet you, Dylan. Okay. So the word university that means out of many one. The original goal of universities was to bring a diversity back to the one truth. And his name is Jesus. He is the truth, the definite article, the truth, the way, the life. I want to point you to Jesus. I want to point you to God's word. I want you to open God's word, open the Bible, put aside the math books, the science books, the philosophy books, everything else. Get alone with God. Ask him. You might not even believe he exists. Ask him. Say, God, do you exist? I want to open your word. I'm going to read it. Will you reveal yourself to me? Do you think God will answer that, that prayer? I think he will, because God, God draws near to those who are humble. He, he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if, if, you'll seek, if you're really a seeker after truth, seek after the truth until you find it, put your tent peg in the ground, and follow him with all your heart. That's all I've been doing for 21 years. I was a 19-year-old. I was a sinner. I was a fornicator, a drunkard, a liar, a thief, a fighter. I would get in fights. But Christ changed me and saved me and delivered me. I'm a testimony of what Christ can do with you, Dylan, and with you, Coffee, Kofi, and with everybody else here, excuse me. He can do it to anyone else here. I'm not one special. The same way he changed me, he can change you. The same eternal life he gave me, he offers to you. The same forgiveness he given to me, he gives to you if you'll, if you'll receive it and, and repentance and faith. Does that make sense? Thanks for asking that question, Dylan. I appreciate it. Yes? So are you saying that we should sacrifice our education for full religion? No, I'm saying, as I said earlier, university, the original but this is called George Mason University. Una is one, diverse, out of many, one. And I'm here to point you to the absolute truth. Young man, young man, the only reason I have an open mind is to finally close it upon the truth. Okay, so if you're a real seeker after the truth, young man, seek after the truth, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's free. If you don't have a Bible, I'll give you one. But you can get on your smartphone and you can read the Bible for free at BibleGateway.com. But, I mean, if you're spending all this money, all this time, I went to college. I know how much money it costs. I know how much time it takes to get good grades. 
You go to college, you spend all this money, this time, you get grades, and you're going to forget about next week how much, what kind of grades you got. Especially when you get to do a job, they're not going to ask you what your GPA is usually. But this is free. This is your eternity on the line. I'm telling you, seek after the truth. I'm not telling you you have to put aside all your studies. I'm simply saying, prioritize. Because we're talking about eternity here. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll get to you next. I want to get to my people. Young man. Can he what? Yeah, it's kind of a silly question. Okay, yeah, yeah young man of Redskins, you bad. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to say my piece and then I'm going to walk. Do you have any questions? Um, I, have a, I, have, I, I have been a Christian for over 13 years. I believe that, um, I that. and no. I, I implore you, please, just allow me to finish what I, what I want to say, and then I will leave the stage for you. Hey, Brother Carl, uh, do you want to preach? That uh, that's what he's, you want to come up after he's left? Ourselves and God. God understands fully well, full well that we won't always be there to, uh, to satisfy uh, our end of the deal. That being said, it is not an excuse to sin and then right, right away go and ask for forgiveness. And you have to repent. But what I'm saying, here's what I'm saying. It, it, the covenant that God makes with us is not a reason to just go and do what you want. Very true, man. That's what I've been preaching all day. But, but that being said, the, the approach is off. Because you're preaching of a wrathful God, not of a loving God. But the Bible describes God as a God of wrath. He's, 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 he's providing a God that's a one-sided God. That God is not wrathful. Does God have judgment day? Does God have hellfire? Will God send sinners to hell, young man? Of course he will. So what you're doing is presenting people a half-truth. It's a whole lie. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. You're not presenting the God of wrath. Because God is a God of wrath. The same God that destroyed the world with a flood in Noah's time, the same God that wiped Sodom and Gomorrah off the face of the planet, is the same God who's still ruling from heaven. And that same God is going to destroy the wicked when he comes back. So you want to present a half God, you must be go for it. But I'm going to tell you this, a half truth is a whole lie. And I'm here to tell you the whole truth. I want you to know the whole truth before you make a decision. Sir, you're using okay. half of the Bible. How are you going to tell him that you can't have half I thought you used half the Bible. You don't use the Old Testament. The Old Testament you said that yourself. You here's, here's, no, I didn't say. Number number one, number one, I've actually quoted from the Old Testament several times today. Number number two, what I said was, if you are listening, what I said was, I'm not required to obey the old covenant laws. But Jesus was Jewish. Right, and he came to fulfill the law. And you're speaking of Jesus' love and his Wait a minute, do you keep the Old Testament law? I'm sorry? Do you keep the Old Testament laws? I've read the entire Do you book. keep the Old Testament laws? Don't sidetrack. Well, then what, what's the problem? You say you don't need to. I say you don't need to. Sounds like you just, you're just you making an excuse for nothing. People turn against me. That's all you're doing. Says the man not reading the whole Bible in itself. Number one, I didn't say I didn't read the whole Bible. Another lie, another false accusation. I am using the whole Bible. The Old Testament. But not all of it is applicable to a New Covenant New Testament Christian according to what the Bible says. The Old Testament. So you don't believe the whole Bible. But what I'm going to do now, the Old Testament. I'm going to give my friend a chance to speak. I've spoken long enough. My friend, I'm giving my friend Carl a chance to speak now, so praise God. The Bible says that the wages, the wages of sin is death. Amen. Amen. So what are you, what are, what are you yielding to today? What are you, are you yielding to sin? Are you yielding to obedience to God? That's the big question. That's the big question of who are you yielding to? Are you yielding to sin? Does sin own you? Does sin own you? Many, many people walking around here, they think they're free. You're free. You're in college. You could do whatever you want to do. But you're not free. You're not free. You are owned. You're owned by sin if you are living in sin. Sin does define you. 
You could say what you want, but so it, it's okay, it's okay. I understand you want to stay in that. Be, you're defending your sin right now. And let me ask you a question. What sin is worth your soul? Jesus said, Jesus said it, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When you stand before God, you think you're going to be able to negotiate as you're trying to negotiate with me to justify your sin? Why should it be a sin to love someone? It's all according to what you describe as love. What is love? You're, you're saying, I, I had a, a man in back of me saying, this is not the message of love. This is a message of hate. It's not a message of hate. It's a message of pure love that speaks from the heart because we don't want to see you go to a place that burns with fire and brimstone because you want to stay in your sin. It is the message of love. If you see this building burning down in flames and your friends screaming out the window, save me, help me, will you run into the building for them? Will you help them or you let them burn? You let them burn. So you're no friend. You're no friend. We come here to express and to deliver the message that delivers you from the thing that is killing you. Sin destroys. Sin is a killer. Sin separates. Sin destroys the family. Sin destroys the neighborhood. Sin destroys the community. All of our sins are forgiven because he died on us. Yeah, but just, listen, just because Jesus came down from earth, uh, from heaven to earth, and he died for man's sins, does not give you a license to sin. I know it doesn't give us a license, but why are you coming over are here? Are we all sinners? Preaching that stuff? Because we come in love. Love warns. Okay, I've not heard one time have you said how sin is forgiven. Sin is forgiven through, you repent, you turn from your sins. Jesus come preaching repentance. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. To be, to be drawn back to God. It's that reconciliation message. And it is available for you. If you will, turn from the thing that's killing you. It costs Jesus his life. What's it going to cost you? But you're only focusing on some of the sins. You're saying homosexuality is a sin, which yes, it says in the Bible. But you, you wear clothes made of multiple fabrics. It says that's a sin in the Bible. You eat seafood. Again, again, you're going back to Levitical law. That law, that that old covenant is doesn't exist anymore. Some people might still, some people might still go by that. But that's not applicable for now. We're in the new covenant. Jesus has put away the letter of the law. It's a part of the Bible. Why do you get to Why should it be that if I love him, then that's fine? But if I love her, then suddenly I'm a sinner. I don't. Why is it that as far, as far as what? As far as having uh, relations, in, intimate relations. It's fine. But if I have a relationship with her, because I'm because it's it's sin. It's sin against your own body. The Bible says, Wherefore God hath given them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor your own body between yourselves. But if you're telling a message of love, then how are you saying that? Lo Listen, that love, love, love is, is not the tolerance of what God calls sin. Love, it warns about what you want to do that is sinful to God. That's the real love. That will, that will save you in the end, if you're obedient unto the message. That's why I ask you, what are you yielding to? Sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? Your obedience to the gospel will, will enable you to be righteous in the sight of God. Okay? And it cleanses you from all sin, when you believe what Jesus did for you. Um, and it's not just a head knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. What you really believe, action will take place. Real belief always brings forth an action. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you're saying it's a message of love. What happened to the wrath of God that he was preaching about like five minutes ago? Right here, right now. Well, well, there is a wrath of God. He that believeth on his Son has everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son 
uh, the wrath of God abides upon him. It's abiding upon you. Jesus himself said in John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Everybody's talking about judgment. But do you understand that you're, uh, if you're sitting here and, you're, and you don't have the Holy Spirit on you, living inside you, Jesus says you're condemned already. That's serious. Can I ask you your name? What if it, my name's Carl. What church do you guys preach with? Uh, right, right now we have a home fellowship. Home fellowship? Yes. Okay. So, in what way does coming around here and preaching to everybody saying like you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus? In what way does that give us like any actual like freedom to go and you know, say walk into the uh, walk to church and like listen to a <laughs> preacher because we want to participate in that religion? Right. Where's the freedom? In that? Because G Jesus tells us to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Why does he tell us to do that? Why? Why does he tell Christians to go preach the gospel to every living creature? I think you can answer that. Well, because he loves you. And that message can save you. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear the word of God. It does something to you. You hear, you hear the message and, and, and the results of an eternity in hell. It makes the mind start thinking. Do you, have you ever thought what's going on? What if you died tomorrow? If I die tomorrow, I'll die a happy man. I live You'll, my life the way I want it to. Okay, but what happens after that? Have you seen a funeral? Have you ever been to a funeral? If I go to heaven or hell, I... Have you ever been to a funeral? No, I'm not. Okay, have you ever... Okay, you're young yet. How old are you? I'm 18. Okay, if you live to be 40, 45 years old, you're going to go to a couple funerals. And you'll follow, you'll follow that hearse that has the body within, within, within it. And you're going to say to yourself, if you're unconverted, as you are now, well, it's over for that guy. Oh, man, it's over for him. He, maybe, maybe, you, maybe he died at 30 years old. He died a, a relatively young man. But it's not over. Eternity has just began. You understand that 150,000 people die within a 24-hour period? For every step one of these kids take over here, everybody's taking a step, two people die. Two people. One day someone's going to take a step. You're going to die. Reality will take place. Reality. Because when, when it all comes down to it, the only thing that matters is truth. Truth. All the religions in the world, it doesn't matter. The only thing that's going to matter is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means eternal life. There's life in him. He is the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So you can't go to the Father except through Jesus. It's a very narrow way. It's not a broad way. Many people are on the broad way that leads to that destruction. We come here in love so that you would go through the narrow gate. Go through Jesus Christ. Go through the door. He is the shepherd. He, he laid his life down for you, man. He laid his life down for you. Don't, don't, don't waste the sacrifice. Okay, so you're coming here and you're saying that homosexual people and intolerant people will go to hell, stuff like that. But the Bible says you, that. Wouldn't you agree that tolerance and being kind to your fellow neighbor, like the Bible says, is a much better way to go about life? Like you're coming here and you're saying <clears> that you're uh, trying to like get people to follow your religion by telling them that if you don't, you're going to be punished. Like you're going to be punished for living your life and being the happy. What if, what if I'm tolerable to that man's sin? I'm tolerable to it, to, uh, to why I don't want to offend him. I don't want to offend him, make him unhappy, make him uncomfortable. He dies two days later. He's in it. From, from what the Bible says, he's gone to hell. Is that love? By his decision. Is that love? By yeah, but at least if I would have warned him, maybe he would have turned from that. If you, you can tell him all you want, but if you... Uh, That's correct. That's why we have free will. You're getting the message today. What are you going to do with that message? When you stand before God, when you stand before Him, He says, What have you done with my son? You think you're going to get into heaven another way? I don't think I need to get into heaven. In all honesty, it's the you, you I, I think I heard you before. You say, Your life doesn't matter so long as you are tolerant and you are happy. You, you've, been, you, you, you've been given the wrong food. You've been given the food of the world. You've been nourished by the food of the world. That's why the Bible says to the Christian to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, they're, they're passing away, the Bible says. They're passing away. You got to go by God, man. You got you, you got to get right. You don't know whether you're going to die tomorrow. Do you know how long you're going to live? I don't. You don't. Well, what's going to matter on that day? What's going to matter on that day? The Bible says, uh, and as it is appointed unto men to die, but after this, the judgment. So there's a judgment coming, whether you like it or not. We're here to warn you of that judgment. We're not here to force things down to your throat. We're here to, to let you make a, a, an intelligent decision. God has written the laws upon your heart. When you break God's law, you do it with knowledge. Your conscience tells you that. She's going to have a yes. Can you inform all of us, are either of you ordained? Are you, okay, where'd you go? That's 50 bucks on the internet. No, it is actually, because if you're coming here to a university, you need to Listen, the only thing that matters is if you're ordained of God. Are you ordained of God? God calls people to the ministry, okay? Yes, and I have a family member, too, actually, okay. that are currently ministers. There is a process, but yes, God, must, God, must, well. God must first call. Well, what does that have to do with preaching the gospel? It means it's, that actually is a better understanding Listen, of it. Listen, if you're a Christian, if, if you're a Christian, you've been called to preach the God. Are you a Christian? No, I'm atheist. Okay, then you're atheist. What? What's that? I'm exploring every religion, the different factors that they have. Well, you need to look into what the truth is. Was That's Je what I'm doing. Was, was Jesus a liar? Was Jesus a liar? No, he was not a liar. The Bible says he was in all counts tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had no sin. When Jesus spoke truth, he, when Jesus spoke, it was truth. He is the life. He laid his life down for a ransom for many. Uh, many of you may think this might seem foolish, but I believe it's because you're trying to, to look for a reason to stay in your sin. When I, was, when I got saved at 40 years old, I did, not want to, I did not want to be converted. I resisted it for a year. I was like you. I was like you. I had many questions. What about the dinosaurs? What about the age of the world? What about this? It all has to do with pr trying to prove the Bible wrong so you could stay in your sin. Yes, that's all it's about. I yeah. Uh, I was just wondering on your standpoint on marijuana and how you feel about it in relation to the Bible. Weed is awesome. That's my Weed is awesome. All right. Well, marijuana, marijuana clouds the mind. Does it not cloud the mind? Does it not cloud judgment? It does Yes, it does. I smoked marijuana. It does all these things. It does all them things. And the same thing with, with alcohol. The same thing with pornography. The same thing with all these habitual types of sin. It clouds your mind. But the Bible doesn't specifically say anything against marijuana. Well, it talks about uh, it talks about sorcery, sorcery, and that's what a marijuana does. Okay, it, it's it's a type of it's pharma, pharmakia. It's called in the Greek, and it, what it does is it it, it changes your mind. Just like liquor changes you. It's called a spirit for a reason. It brings on another spirit. It's not you. It's not natural. It's not natural for you to smoke marijuana. It's not natural for you to smoke cigarettes. So when you get a headache, or yes. say you, you know, break your arm, you take acid. It's right. the same exact thing, right? No, it's not. It's not, it's not. it's not clouding my mind. It's not clouding my judgment. I don't, I, don't, I don't find myself in someone else's bed in the morning after taking a couple Tylenol. It just does not happen. I'm sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't ruin me. No, no. No, no. Listen, you guys are still trying to justify your sin. What sin is worth your soul? What sin is worth your soul? Listen, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm telling you what the I'm telling you what Jesus said. And I'm telling you that Jesus was no liar. That's why Jesus said to repent, to turn from your ways. Turn from your ways. 
Jesus. Well, I'm, I'm telling you about Jesus. That's why we're here. We're here to tell you about the message of Jesus Christ. And I know it might seem foolish unto you. The Bible says the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. If you're, if you're perishing today and this message seems foolishness, you're perishing. Your soul is perishing. You're far from God. But it's not His will for you. He wants you to come back. He wants you to come back to the kingdom. Your sin has blinded your minds. The book of Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy. His ear is not slack that he cannot hear. But he says, Your iniquities, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins, your sins, has blinded the minds, uh, has, has blinded the minds of them that believe not. And the Bible says that in, in Isaiah that he will not hear you because of these sins. So I'm going to backtrack for a second. You guys said that you were ordained by God, but you're not ordained by an actual ministry? Uh, I'm not. He is. Okay. He is. So then who are you to tell us like, what to believe? I'm telling you what the Bible says. Okay. You don't have to believe it. You have free will. Free will. The Bible says if I knew before God, I can stand before men. So if I understand what God is telling me to do with my life, then who are you to tell me that what I'm... Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. So then you shouldn't be asking me that question. But you're standing here trying to tell me. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And I'm telling you what the Bible says. Does the Bible say, be holy for I am holy? <laughs> it, it does say that, doesn't it? How are you to be holy? Yes. The Bible says to be holy, for I am holy. Yes. How are you to be holy? Okay, you need to be holy. You need to be obedient unto what the Bible says. Okay, you need to repent of your sins. Jesus will cleanse you from that. Okay, he'll cleanse you from all your sins. You don't understand it? I understand. Okay. So, so then, and then you walk. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. You need to walk in the light and not in the darkness. Okay, but what no, actually, Jesus says you're already condemned if you're not born again. Jesus said you must be born again. To, Jesus said you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah, but God wants God wants you to be perfect. God wants you to be perfect. We can't be perfect. God wants you to walk in holiness. God wants you to, listen, 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 we have, we have enough knowledge in here. Can, can you be obedient to what God says? I am being obedient to what God says. I'm just saying that we're not all perfect. How you could all, be, you could be, listen, be listen, all listen, listen all you can be perfect in obedience. Love. His grace, His mercy, we're all forgiven. You're, you're forgiven if you if you walk in holiness. If you go back to the darkness, what's going to happen? Well, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you did. I don't know you. No, I, I don't know what you are. I don't even know your. I don't even know your name. Jesse, nice to meet you. But what I'm saying is that is that you must walk in the light, as He is in the light. Okay, and we must have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not just a little bit, not, a, not, a, not just a portion. Unfortunately, always do it, but guess what? Because of His grace and mercy, He always forgives us. So you think that you have a license to sin? No, I didn't. Did that come out of my mouth? No, I did not say that. None of those words came out of my mouth. So I said that if it happens, so he's giving us a If. The Bible, the Bible commands us over and over not to sin. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. So we're, hold on. We're commanded not to sin. And John says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So yes, it's possible and, and it could happen that you could sin, but it shouldn't be purposely. It shouldn't be on purpose. It, it's if you sin. You don't, you don't wake up with the mindset saying, I'm gonna sin today. I'm gonna sin tomorrow. 
You don't, come, you don't wake up with that mindset. You wake up with the mindset that, that I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. That strengthens me. Can you do all things in Christ? Can you be obedient to Christ? Okay, then, then wake up with that mindset. I know, but like, we always fall short. That's the thing. You're quoting a verse, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, all have, for all have sinned, past tense. The Bible says to awake to righteousness. Paul, the apostle of grace, said to awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. He says, I speak this to your shame. If you think that you're awaking to righteousness and you're going to sin today, are you going to sin today? Yes, if, if you think you're, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so he is. If you wake up with the mindset of you're going to sin, you're going to sin. Did I say that I was waking up to go sin? No, I don't wake up with the mindset. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible commands us not to sin. Over and over again. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Did Jesus say, go and sin some more? Look, look, you keep talking about what the Bible says. Right. The Bible says that if a woman commits adultery, she should be stoned. Right. Again, you're, go you're going by the Old Testament. I mean, it's in the Bible, is it not? Yeah, again, we keep referring back to the Old Testament laws. It back then, when God was bringing forth the people, he gave, he gave the law. So it says in there. Yes, the if, if if we were going by the Old Testament laws, yes, that that that's how that's what God did, and that was a holy law. That law was holy, and what they have done was unholy. So how do you draw the line where you're just going to disregard? Because we're in the New Testament. We're not in that anymore. That's why that Old Testament. That an entire section of the Bible is irrelevant. Uh, it's not irrelevant. It's for our learning. It's for our, it's, it, it's, it's to uh, given us uh, awareness of what these things are. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality. Uh, you know, bestiality uh, in, in the book of Leviticus is named in, with homosexuality. This, this is what God looks upon it like. Half of your religion because it's old. phrase that says a man shall not lay with a man actually a mistranslation. The it's exact, not a mis mistranslation. The phrasing from the Greek says a man should not lay with a boy, which means it's against pedophilia. Well, he should. Okay, so what, ab <laughs> what about 1 Corinthians 6, 9? <laughs> I, I know you don't believe it. You, again, you're, try you're trying to, to dismantle the Bible, and you have your reasons for it. No, no. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, which are homosexuals, uh, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, which are sodomites, they abuse their bodies, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, drunkards, being drunk will send you to hell. Being drunk. Sounds like a good way to go. It's not a good way to go. Hell's going to be forever. You, you know, you could be forgiven of all these things. You can have everlasting life. Yes. I got two questions. First of all, um, you're, you're saying that sinning will send you to hell, like repenting from your sin is the way to go to heaven. The Bible is clear that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven, but you must, you can't come to God with a, with a mindset. I'm not saying, listen, go and get your life all straightened out and then come back to God and say, here I am, God. I'm all straight now. No, it's the mindset of repentance. It's that broken heart for what sin has cost. It has cost the dear life of Christ. Christ died for sin. Sin has a, it, there, there's a, there's a, a big, uh, how shall I say it? There's a, there's a big consequence for sin, okay? But Jesus conquered that. He can give you the victory over that. And it's faith in, in, in Christ and what he has done. But we can't come to God with uh, a mindset of, well, God, I want to give up these. I'm going to give up these sins, but I don't want to give up these. These I want to hold on to. It's not going to hear you. you. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You're preaching to kids that don't know Jesus and telling them to repent from their sin. That's the wrong word. There, are, do you have sin? Okay, well then you need to repent from it. What kids? What kids are you talking about? What kids? I'm telling, um, but they can know Jesus. 
but they can't know Jesus. They can't be born again if they're still in their sin. They need to have the mindset of repentance, turning from that, giving their life to Jesus, and then Jesus will, in return, baptize them with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> What's that? We're not a denomination. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. You can read the New King James. That's also a good. Ver that's a good version. Okay, it's got the thous and the these, the, the King James, but the New King James is is just as good. You know, it's a little, it's it's more uh, up to date in, in English language. But yeah, uh, that's a good question, and go with the New King James. It, it's a it's a good version. What's your name? Henry. Are are you saved? No. Okay. But reading the Bible, even though you might have a proper a translation that you can understand, it might still not, you might not still be able to understand that. Uh, the Bible says uh, the natural man does not receive the things of the, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them. Uh, but, you know, we need to uh, get born again. A lot of people will say, hey, I, I didn't understand what the Bible says. But was, when I got saved, it all came alive to me. You know, you read God's Word, it's, it's a Christian's food. It's their food. You need to feast on the Word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by, on bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is a Christian's food. But you first need to be born again. You need to give your life to Christ. Jesus said, if any man, any man come after me, let him deny himself. That's talking about repentance, turning, deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sakes and the gospels, the same shall save it. So what Jesus is saying there, hey, you want to hold on to that old sinful life? You're going to lose eternal life. Okay, you're going to lose that. But if you, if you give it all up, if you step over the line and give your life to me, turn from them things, repent. He's going to give you ever. You're going to save your life. You're going to gain eternal life. That's what he looks to give you. He looks to give you that. He longs to give you that. He stands. He's looking for you. You've gone away from the Father. The Father's looking for the sons and daughters. He's earnestly looking. He'll run to you, man. You need to seek the Lord. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. God is near, but you need to seek him. You need to draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. We need to cleanse our hands. That means, again, repent. Repent. Cleanse our hands, he says, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. We purify that by God giving us his Holy Spirit. Okay? Turn from the sins. Receive the purification, the sanctification. God will, God will sanctify you, man. He'll give you new desires. He'll give you a new spirit. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new heart. You'd be surprised what God can do. Once you, know, you understand that God wants you in heaven with Him. He wants you seated down at the table. He wants you at the feast. You know, the Bible says uh, uh, to go out into the highways and, and byways and compel them to come in. That's why we're here. We're trying to compel you to come in. God, you know, God loves you, but you got to understand God is a judge. When Jesus, you know, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You think he's coming back as a, as a babe in a manger? He's not coming back as a babe. He's not coming back as a sacrifice. The Bible says he's coming back as a judge. Coming back as a judge. Got to understand that. Yeah, understand it. The Bible says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then He says, then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in their father's kingdoms. He says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Have ears, hear it, take it in. Take it in. Don't, don't neglect so great salvation, man.
please, please, I, I beg you, I beseech you, give your life to Christ, man. Don't let, don't let the world rob your eternity. The world cares nothing for you. Care nothing for me. Christ looks to save you, man. He, he wants to give you a new life. He wants, you to, he wants you to be victorious, to walk in this world, and then to walk into the kingdom. He wants you to walk into the kingdom and sit down at the table with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I beseech you to do that. I, be, I beg you to do that. That's why we're here. We're compelling people to come in. Hi. So you said that your theological belief is that uh, homosexuality is a sin against God, right? Yes. So how do you, how do you reconcile that God is love? How do you, how do you take that and then believe that He condemns love? Well, it's all, again, it, it's what you consider what love is. You know, what does what does homosexuality do? What does it do? Yeah, what do, what does it do? Um, does it re, does it reproduce? Does it reproduce life, or does it cause STDs? Does it cause STDs? Does it co does it cause a a a, a mindset of of, of a suicide? To a point, I believe it does. I believe the suicidal rate amongst the homosexual community is higher than that of the of the. No, I know that you believe because that's what you've been fed. But understand that it's not natural for someone to be into homosexuality. It's not normal. There, there, there's a weight that comes on a person when they're in that lifestyle, and it's not from everybody judging them and doing this. It's the weight of God's law. The Bible is a lot of its interpretation, the way that you interpret it. It's not the way. I'm talking about the conscience, man. I'm talking about breaking God's law. You have a conscience. The Bible says uh, that God has written His law upon the tables of your heart. So when you do the things that are contrary to His law, you do them which, with knowledge. Your conscience bears witness with that. Your conscience is a strong testimony to the grace of God. God, God, God gave you a conscience for a reason, so that you would know that you're doing the wrong thing. Whether it's homosexuality, stealing, lying, getting drunk, fornicating, whatever the sin may be. God, God is, He's given you that law. Sir, what's your back? What's your pants made out of? I don't know, I didn't check. The same part of the Bible that you quote for why homosexuality is a sin also right. says we can't eat shellfish, wear mixed fabrics, uh, uh, things like uh, that. And that is coming from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is our history. It's where we came from. It's how we know that God sent His Son, Jesus, to come save us and redeem us. And the entirety of the New Testament of Jesus' word to us from right. God is talking about how we should love and accept each other. And being gay is not a sin. We, it's just love. It's also, just love. Being gay is only referenced once in the New Testament. I believe it's a contextual thing. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not contextually. Talking about if a man lies with another, a man lies with a boy. That is referring to an old pagan practice used to make sure that a man and a woman, when they the Bible says in in the book of Romans, wherefore God has given them up to uncleanness. So once you're doing that type of sin, He's going to give you up to it. And, they, and it says, wherefore they dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It says, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And it says, likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. There's a natural use for the man and the woman. And it says they burned in their lusts one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense for, that, for their error. I just would, would like you to consider, sir, and all of you, that there's, there is a chance that you're wrong. And preaching it as if it's truth, it turns people... Listen, I, I've been a sinner for 40 years. You can't, how old are you? I'm 20, okay? I've lived 30, 34 years longer than you have. I've been in the world a lot longer. I know what the world does, and I know, I know, listen, I was like you. I didn't want to come out of my sin. I desired, I liked rolling around in the pig pen. I, I liked it. I thought I was okay. I was a good person. I never raped anybody. I never murdered anybody. Hey, I didn't judge him. I never judge anybody. Do what you want to do. Live and let live. 
But your argument is that it's wrong to be gay because of conscience, but if you're not gay... It's not wrong because of conscience. I'm saying God gave you the conscience to let you know that it's wrong. It's an awareness. It's an awareness. You, you, ever, you have someone sitting in the courtroom of your mind saying, hey, don't do that. Or you shouldn't have done that. Why do you think there's remorse? But how can you believe that that exists if you're not gay? You don't know how... how Listen, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. You're assuming that people who are gay feel guilty about it, but you can't... Know. Many do. Many do. Many don't. Many have been given over. They've been given, given over to that. But many, many are still struggling with their conscience. Many are still struggling with that, that heart issue. Why are people looking at me this way? Why is my family rejecting me? Why, 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 why is my conscience pricking me that every time I'm doing this certain act that it's wrong? Why is it beyond what other people are saying? Why is my conscience telling me that? But there comes a time when the conscience gets seared. Psst. It gets seared and, and it no longer, it no longer has an effect. Although they know it's wrong, they do not, it doesn't affect them as much. That's a...